If heaven is interested in our salvation, should we be interested in our salvation? Amen. We should. So much so that all of heaven is moving and they're thinking something. Heaven knows that it is urgent, the time in which we live. But we don't know how urgent it is. Heaven knows, but we don't know. If we could hear the spirit of heaven, it would be a spirit of urgency. In fact, let me read this statement before we read Matthew 24. Let me read this statement from the screen. Talking about the urgency of heaven. This is coming from manuscript book one, page 222. Let's read this together. Father, anoint these words as we have opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's read that together. It says, at times I feel the power of God even in my flesh, and yet I am not satisfied. The prophet says, I want more of his spirit. Have you ever been thirsty before? The prophet was thirsty. She says, I want to plunge deeper and deeper, where? In the ocean of God's love. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Deeper yet, deeper yet into the crimson flood. Deeper yet, deeper yet under the precious blood. It says, I want to plunge deeper and deeper into the ocean of God's love, and be wholly swallowed up in him. Be strong in God. Do not sink. My vision comes up before me and the words, not of Sister White, but the words, watch, watch now, of what? Yeah. Of the angel even now seem to be ringing in my ears. What were the words? Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Time is what? Oh. How does heaven feel? How does heaven feel when it looks at time? time Only got a little bit left. It says time is almost finished, almost finished, almost finished. Can you hear the spirit? Cry, cry for the arm of the Lord to be revealed, for the arm of the Lord to be revealed. We should be praying, God, move upon our hearts. Move in our lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our homes. It says pray for the arm of the Lord to be revealed. Time is almost finished. What you do, you must do quickly. Do you believe that? Heaven knows the time is short. Has God made it possible for you and I to know? Yes. He has. In Matthew 24, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 3. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says, let's read that together. It says, and he, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be thy sign, or the sign of thy coming, and of the... So the disciples were interested, as we were pointing out in our studies, about this end of the world. They asked for signs. Heaven says, time is almost finished. Cry, cry, for the arm of the Lord to be revealed. Time is almost finished. Jesus says, in answer to the question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What did Jesus say? In verse 4, he says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that what everybody no man deceive you. That means that in the last days there will be what? Deception. So that we have to understand truth, how? For ourselves. Now jump down to verse 32. Concerning the sign of the end. Verse 32 says that we can know. Verse 32, let's read that. It says, now learn a parable of what everybody? The fig tree. The fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you guess that summer is nigh. Is that what it says? Now, you don't guess that. I mean, right now, it's literally dealing with the time we're dealing in right now. Right now, you see the tender uh, leaves and, and, and these, uh, uh, the, the, the branches that are coming back, young branches. You can tell by the color. You can see the, 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 the nice leaves that are just greening, ripening. And Jesus says, when you see that, you know that summer is not far away. You know that you're in spring. You know that the season or the time of summer is near. And then he says in verse 33, so likewise... When ye shall, what's the next word? Now, Jesus said that there are going to be some things that we can what? See, see visible or invisible? Visible. visible. So he says, there are going to be things visible that you see. Then he says, you're going to see all these what? Things. What does that mean? Things. Events. events. So the Bible is telling us that we will be able to see coming events. And by seeing these things, we're to know something. We're not looking for leaves. The leaves represent these visible events that are upon the world that show something. It says, when we see these things, continuing on, know that it is near when? Even at the doors. We studied this in detail. So we found out that there are visible events that we can see. That when we see those events, we can know something about the season or the time. 
What can we know? That we're even at the? Door. What does that mean? Verse 34. Verily. In other words, if you don't understand what it means, let me make it plain. Let me give you of a certainty of a surely. It means verily I say unto you. What's the next two words? This generation shall not pass till what? So there are events that will let us know if we are in this what? Is that what the text says? Yes. Who's talking in that text? Jesus. Do you believe Jesus? Yes. He's saying that there are visible events that we should be able to look upon, upon, upon the earth. That if we see these visible events, we would know the generation that we're in. Now, when he says this generation, we know that that's not a general generation. And this is a specific definite article. It means something specific. So he says this generation, what generation is he talking about? He says the generation that shall not what? Pass. Till all these things be fulfilled. So then this is not the first generation. This is the last generation or the final generation. So God is telling us through Jesus that there are visible events on the earth that when we see it, we can know that we're in the generation that's going to see the end of the, the world. And my question is, do you see it? That's the question. Because if we see it, then we know that this is the generation. You don't guess. You know the time that now that it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It says, last night a scene was presented before me. I may never feel free to reveal all of it, but I will reveal what, everybody? The prophet says, I'll give you a little bit. It seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses. It, let's read that again. It seemed that a what? Immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed and the prophet's not telling us everything but she says I'm going to give you a little bit of what I saw yes. I want to ask you a question what does that sound like an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses what does that sound like is happening what's, what's happening here have you ever thought about it what could that be an immense ball of fire Sounds like it could be a star falling from the sky, sounds like. Now, have you heard in recent times where scientists have said that an asteroid missed the Earth? Meteorite missed it. And we know oh, nothing like that will ever come down and happen to us. <laughs> we almost hit, hit uh, one almost hit there, a big one. It's, it seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses. From place to place rose the cry, the Lord has come. So some people thought that that event was so traumatic or so tragic that it must be the coming of the Lord. But it wasn't the coming of the Lord. It says, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but not everybody, but what? A few, a few were saying, praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. So when they saw that, they said, praise the Lord. And some people were saying, what, praise the Lord? What are you talking about? Immense balls of fire. I mean, think about it. If, 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 a, if a nuclear uh, uh, warhead had come down out of the sky from another place and boom, knock down houses. And then other people are saying, people's lives are gone, houses destroyed. And another group are saying, praise the Lord. You might wonder in your mind, what are you praising God about? <laughs> so it says, praise the Lord. And then they said, why are you praising the Lord? That's what it said. <laughs> Inquired those upon whom was coming sudden destruction. Man, your house is gone and you hear somebody say, praise the Lord. You say, what are you praising the Lord about? It says, why are you praising the Lord? Inquire those upon whom comes coming sudden destruction. Let's read that together. Because we now, stop, we now what? See. see what we have been. They said because we now what? See. Now remember Jesus said when you what? See. see. You know what's happened. So these people were aware of some of the coming events. And they now are looking and they said praise God we just saw it. The others are saying they don't know what's happening. They don't know the coming events. They didn't take this class. And so they're looking at it and they're saying, why are you praising God about this? Now, of course, these people praising the Lord, they were a little bit at fault, some of them. And we're going to see in a moment. Because there was something that they were supposed to do instead of just praise the Lord. Now, watch what this says. Because we now see what is coming. This is reflecting Christ, 243. It says, if, if you what? Believe that these things were coming. Why did you not? Now, what did this people say? 
Now, the other people now that see their lives gone, properties gone, different things happening. What are they saying? If you believe this and you knew you're saying praise the Lord now because it happened. What did it, what should we have done? What should the persons who say praise the Lord? What should their men have done first? They should have told somebody. We were just talking about before y'all came in today. We were talking about Ezekiel and saying, you know, the watchman on the wall and you held responsible. We held responsible. We have to give the trumpet a certain sound. To let people know what's coming. So as we are learning in this class and we're studying, it's not enough for us just to keep it in this church. Is it enough? No. There are family members that don't know what we're studying. There are other church members that are not coming week by week, whether through whatever circumstances, they don't know. And pretty soon we're getting ready to, uh, we're getting ready to start a program and getting all of those missing members back. We're going we're gonna to show how we're going to do it by the grace of God. But not time yet. Not time for that yet. First, God must do something internally. First for us right now, and then he's going to start overflowing to reach other church members and other churches and then into the community and then into the world. But it must start at the right place. And by God's grace, this church will become a beacon of light to the entire community, the entire world. But it must start first within. Now, this says, if you believe these things were coming, why did you not what? Tell us was the response, was the terrible response. Now, watch what they said should have happened. It says, we did not know about what? Give another name for these things. Events. So they said, look, Jesus, you studied the words of Christ and you learned coming events, but you did not what? Tell us. Not only did you not tell us what was coming, but you did not tell us how to prepare. So then there is a, a work of not only showing others what's coming, but then showing them how to prepare. But how can we show others how, what's coming and how to prepare if we don't know what's coming and we are not prepared? So first step before going out telling others what's coming and how to prepare them, we need to be their students learning what's coming and preparing. Does that make sense? Yes. And then we have something to tell. Now, it says if you, uh, we did not know these things. Now, let's read this carefully. Why did you what? Leave us in ignorance. Again and again, you have what? Seen us. You went to our stores. You saw us at school, at work. At play. Why do you not, number one, become acquainted with us and two, tell us of the judgment to come and that we must serve God lest we perish. Now we are lost. Their blood be upon us. Now, so then the secret is now once we need to learn what's coming and rush out and tell everybody what's coming, right? Uh-uh. What does it say? Again and again, you have seen us. Why did you not, not tell us what's coming. It said, why did you not, what? Become acquainted with us and tell us. So what we have to do as missionaries is to learn how to get acquainted with people. We have to learn how to get to know them. See, men will not care what you know if they do not know that you care. So that a missionary is very simple. Learn how to get to become a friend of somebody. See, coming events, it's understanding and helping others will not help them unless we first can get to know them. And as we begin to get to know them, then we can begin to plant the seeds of what's coming and how to prepare. Does it make sense? So then if we want to be better missionaries while learning what's coming, what should we be practicing and learning and asking God to help us to learn how to do? How do you become acquainted with people? When you go to the store, do you simply stay at your grocery basket? Stay in line. You don't really say anything. You're COVID-19, so you don't, you don't really, you don't, you don't, you know, you're not talking anymore. Is that, is, is that what you do? Or do you learn how to spread out? And be careful. Be cautious. Don't be foolish. But in your carefulness and cautiousness, do you begin to reach out? Yeah. You know, so you're at the gas station, you're pumping gas and you see somebody else there. You say, well, I'm not going to say anything. You're just pumping gas. Or do you have to uh, 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 learn how to be aware of the people around you? Wherever you are, you can be a missionary. Missionary work is not something you put on or take off. A missionary is not simply you do, it's who you are. And so by God's grace, we must be learning. My daughter and I, we were working on doing some type of carpentry work together. Now don't be, don't be alarmed. Your daughter can learn how to do that too. <laughs> You'll be alarmed. <laughs> but we were doing some type of work together and as we were doing it, 
we were talking, we were having a class on missionary work as we were working. How to be a missionary, how to talk, how to become the friend. We were going through lessons of that as we were working. And we were talking about just the idea, how do you meet people? And I was saying, look, it's very simple. God, God doesn't complicate things. He makes it simple. I mean, but, but the problem is sometimes we don't know that this is a successful part of being a missionary. Now, uh, I remember I, was, I stopped at a gas station pumping gas. And a person was up in, in, in the other side and they looked like they didn't want to say anything to me. Uh, <laughs> they want to talk. And so uh, knowing the nature of missionary work and how it works and how to talk to people. And knowing, so you've got to understand uh, the nature of man. And by doing that, I looked at him and I could see he didn't want to talk. So I looked at his truck. He had a big truck. And I said, man, that's a nice truck, brother. Hey, you like this truck? <laughs> I said, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a truck similar to that. I said, I look like a lariat right there. He, he, he look, man, you know, the truck is a man. man. He started talking about, man, yeah, yeah, I got this for you. He started talking. And before you know it, he was opening up. Now, see, we've got to learn how to begin to talk with each other, become acquainted so that it says, if you believe that these things were coming, why did you not tell us? We did not know about these things. Why did you leave us in ignorance again and again? You have seen us. Why have you not, what, talk to me, become acquainted with us and tell us of the judgment to come and that we must serve God lest we perish in order to help people to understand the last message, we've got to learn how to become acquainted with people. I wonder where we learned that. Well, there's some things you will never learn in heaven. You've got to learn them first on the earth. <laughs> You know how you learn that? God has given us what is called a home. Yeah. If we don't learn how to be friendly with each other in the home, do you think we're going to learn how to be friendly with people outside of the home? Yes or no? no? Impossible. And so my brothers and sisters, it says parents do what? Teach your children regarding the things that are coming upon the earth. Not just teach the adults. It says parents teach your children. Teach your what? Our children. We're to take our children out and teach them, not just teach them Sesame Street and, and Barney and all this other foolishness, but it says teach them what? What is coming upon the earth? Can the children know what's coming upon the earth? Yes. They can learn. It says teach them what's coming upon the earth and lead them to do what? So what two things are happening? We're telling them what's coming and showing them how to prepare. So that then we can go out of the home and tell others what is coming and show them how to prepare. It says, lead them to prepare to meet their Lord in peace. Gain a knowledge of the scriptures. Do not fill their head with television. That's what it's telling us. Don't fill their head with rap music and worldly music and just country music. Do not fill their head with the nonsense of what? Novels. Brain nerve power is required by those who desire to comprehend the truth. It takes brain to understand. So clearly that they can teach it intelligently to others. We have none too much brain power. We don't have enough brain power. You know? <laughs> Do you know that brain cells, the over 14 billion brain cells in these brains, and brain cells do not regenerate themselves naturally. You have other cells that regenerate themselves, but not the brain cells. When you mess it up through smoking and drinking and partying and living wrong, when we mess this up with not resting and strengthening and eating properly, when we mess up those brain nerves, those brain cells don't come back unless under a divine miracle of God. It says... We don't have too much brain power. Never can we afford to use what? Never. Now, and when it says we cannot afford, it's not talking about how, how much it costs. Now, it costs a lot of money. I mean, it, when a man takes tobacco and he has a habit, that it costs a lot of money. Yeah. A man, I mean, he's smacking, he's smoking two packs a day, having the cans snuff of the here and there. I mean, that's, that's a habit. I mean, a person comes to my house and uh, uh, where we live and people coming over, everyone have snuff. They're just, just in Virginia, made of snuff. You know that. <laughs> I mean, you know, Virginia used to be the capital of, uh, of tobacco growing and all of the, uh, you know, Virginia Slims, you know, you know, it's called Virginia Slims. But but all of that with, with all that, that stuff, person coming. I remember talking to a man. He said, yeah, my, 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 all my father and his father, we had, we had acres of acres of nothing but tobacco. Then he was, I won't go into that story now, but, but we started getting acquainted. I started learning some things about the history of that. But anyway, so 
In the midst of him talking about that, he began to start, he just, you know, he's just spitting out. Just nothing, nothing here. Now, after a little while, we, we, have a, we have a habit on our property. A person comes along enough and they cross the bridge. Now, we have a little, when, when they don't cross the bridge, we talk to them differently. But when they cross the bridge, bri crossing the bridge is like coming into heaven. When they cross the bridge, we tell them, on this property, we don't smoke. It's like heaven. We tell them, we tell them to people. It's, it's like heaven. So I said, we're training our family to learn heaven. You know, in heaven, that's not going on. No, no pollution like that. I said, now, if you, want, if you stay over there, you can, you can do it over there. But when you cross the bridge, mm -mm. We'll holler back and forth. <laughs> we, talk, we talk like that. I said, we'll even come out to talk to you. you know? The angels will come out and meet us wherever we are. Amen. And the man started saying, I respect that. I, 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 I want to learn how to be like heaven. He, he was just talking about the various things. Now, in this Tobacco will destroy, guess what? The brain. But it's not just the cost of it. And I told him, I said, look, I said, you know, I said, even though we're learning this, I said, God is, God is merciful to meet a sinner where he is. And I tell him, I said, I said, I'm a sinner. I need help. And I said, we're just trying to do everything we can. He said, look, oh, we're, we're all sinners. He's, he just now recognizes. Now, my, my brothers and sisters, it says never can we afford, but not just the money habit. It's saying we cannot afford to use tobacco because of its effects upon the brain, the body, and the spirituality. It says, or alcoholic liquors, or any what? Injurious substance, for we must strive to keep our minds clear for the work of saving souls. Our souls and the souls of others. The Lord is pleased with those who manifest fervent earnestness in his service. It is the privilege of how much? Everyone to cultivate faithfully every God-given power. So my brothers and my sisters, good morning, happy Sabbath. So my brothers and my sisters, it's important to us that we keep the mind clear. Is that right? Yes. It's important to us that we gain the knowledge, that we teach our children of what's coming upon the earth. Do we need to get our families ready? Yes or no? Yes. Is something coming? Yes. We put this slide up week by week. I want your mind to be this etched in. What does that say? Talk to me. Thinking. Now, what did we learn about the thinking men? What did we learn about them? Talk to me. Yeah. They understand. Do they see the visible events? Do they see the visible events? Yes. They see the events that show that this generation is coming to an end that this is the final generation. They don't understand what it means, but they see these events. And these thinking men are recognizing, they have their attention fixed, these thinking men, upon the events taking place about us. They recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. Upon every what? Earthly what does it mean, every earthly element? Every earthly element. What is it talking about? Every field of knowledge. Every part of the world that we know about. Tell me some of the parts. We talk about this all the time. Tell me some of the parts. Financial. Financial. Tell me another part. Health. Health. Tell me another part. Water. Water. Tell me another part. Food. Food. Finances. Uh, the political government. The system. All of this, they recognize in looking at the events that that means something. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out last time it says, what do they know by looking at the data? What do they know about the end of the world? What do they, what do they see something? They see that what? Talk to me. They see that 2030 means something based on events. Now, I want to ask you a question. When they say that, are they looking at the number 2030 and that's why they get 2030? What are they looking at? Data. They're looking at data. <laughs> Praise God, Brother Tony. They're, look, they're looking at what? What do you mean by data? When you say data, what do you mean? Information. 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 Knowledge. Facts. Not fiction. Facts. They look, look at this. Today, we have enough what? Talk to me. Enough what? Data. data. About our ecosystem. In other words, the, the system of life we know about. They have, we have enough data, but, but guess what? G guess what's happened? It says, in a world where most of us do not have time to read. read the studies explaining that 2030 is the year. In other words, there are studies lined up upon, uh, uh, stacked up, upon studies. But most do not understand these studies because we don't have time to read them. We found out that one of these thinking men, one of these studies that were done was in put, uh, published in a little uh, 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 journal called Popular What? Now, who do you think normally thinks about science? Don't, uh, the people who don't think or thinking men? Thinking so this is thinking men. It says 40 years after its initial publication, a study called, here's one of the studies, a study called The Limits to Growth is Looking Depressingly Prescient, commissioned by international, what's that next word? Yeah. International what? Yeah. Why am I pointing that out? International think. Yeah. Because the prophet said that thinking men would be watching and they would see these things. Mm. It says, call, uh, it says the 1972 report found that if civilization, society, continued how? 
on its path toward increasing consumption, the global economy would collapse by what event? What date are they looking at? 20 what? Now, are they making this up because they just say, you know, I'm just going to pick 2030 and I, I set that time and 2030 means something's going to happen. Is that what they're doing? No. They're looking at information. They're recognizing that the way society is living, civilization, that if there's no change by 2030, but what if society were to change for the worse? It might actually be faster than what? 2030. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says population losses would ensue and things would generally fall apart. We don't have time to read through it all. It says, as reported, the study took into account pollution levels. What else? Population growth. What else? The amount of are natural resources limitless or do they have a limit? Natural resources and the overall quality of life on earth, the model's predictions for the worsening quality of life and the dwindling natural resources has so far been unnervingly what? So way back in 1970s, this report was done. And from 1970 to 2021, it has almost been directly on point. Now, what was uh, another major test for this 1970 report, 1972? In fact, what does it say? 2020. 2020 is the first milestone. That's when the quality of life is supposed to drop how? At around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes highly? Critical. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did it meet the 2020 marker? Yes. Is it on target? Yes. It's on target. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means the thinking men are right on point. Why the fall of the American Empire will come by what? Now this is not the this is not the the, the one who's dealing with the, 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 the just looking at the, uh, uh, the 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 water or just looking at the uh, uh, science or the climate. This man is a historian. The historian Alfred McCoy explains why American power is coming to an end. It says the histor historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what? Now why is he saying the same thing as the other man? Though they're looking at different events. Why is he saying the same thing? Because in every field of knowledge, the same conclusion is reaching. It says, grown rapidly by 2020 and will reach a critical mass no later than what? So we see the same thing happening. They're saying, by looking at the events, that something was supposed to happen beginning in 2020 that's going to get worse and worse and worse until its climax in 2030, if it even gets to 2030. This is what the thinking men are saying. Is it because there are prophets? They're looking at the events that are taking place on the earth. That is data, that is information, that is fa factional evidence. The looming, what? Food crisis. And the food uh, global report. It's a 2030. We're experiencing the greatest famine the world has ever seen. We don't have time to go through it. India will soon run out of what, food and water. <coughs> it says extremely high crisis level report says the world needs a what? Water. The world has enough water for 7 billion people, but not if countries do what? Waste, hoard, or weaponize it. Has something happened with water? Yes or no? Yes. It says prepare for the next conflict. What's the next conflict? Water, water wars. It says global water war threat by what? Now, why, why the same time? Whether you deal with food or water, whether you deal with history or science, whether you deal with political or, or climate change, why is everything, every field of knowledge telling us the same thing? It says prepare for this. Brothers and sisters, we saw that water wars are what? Now, here's back in 2015, like we talked about. It says, remember the, remember the rhyme we read last week? Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The rhyme of the ancient marina, the world is a wash where? In water. 90, over 90%, we see this. It says, start planning for a world with a lot less what? Water. This is March 2021. We saw that it says that in a world without water, food production does what? Stop. Cities cease to what? Economic activity grinds to a halt and greenery returns to a desert. 
This is the forum on the 2020 global risk. They recognize the risk of what's taking place. And all of them, they said that the water is predicted to exceed supply by 40% by what year? Why the same? Why is the data always the same? You know what God's trying to tell us? Something's happening. Now, it says climate change and food-driven water demand are creating a toxic cocktail. Water stress. Suffering is worse than drought in 1,200 years. Now, how can you have a flood and yet have a drought? How can that happen, Brother Jimmy? How can you have a 100-year flood and then a drought? Something's going on. Now, it says by, what's that next year? By what? 2025, two-thirds of the world's population could be living under water stress condition. So they show us that another major milestone is what? Talk to me. If God even allows that. You better watch this. What year did it say? 20 what? Now, keep that in your mind. We'll come back to that another time. It says, the U.S. National Intelligence Strategy released in September of last year highlights an elevated potential for water scarcity to generate what? Now, what does instability mean? It's not stable. Give me a little more. That's right. It's not stable. Instability, yes, stable. But give me a little more. Weak, all right. Uh, when something's not stable, what, what, do you, what do you think? It's wobbly, and when something's getting ready to wobble, what do you think about that thing? It might what? It might get ready to collapse or fall. So what would happen to happen to America? Chaos. But what would have to happen to America before you see a Sunday law? Guess what has to happen? Do you know that there must be an unstable condition that causes the America economy, its system of living to collapse? And by its collapse, see, the Bible tells us the second angel is going to preach. Babylon is standing straight up. Is that what it says? No. Babylon is what? Fallen. Collapse. Why? Because she made how many nations? All nations drink of the wine, the wrath of fornication. So what is getting ready to happen if the church collapses and it now is making a nation drink its teaching? What happens to the church must necessarily happen to the nation. This is what happens when a church controls a state. Now, my brothers and sisters, if the Babylon is falling, what would a nation do that does that same thing? What would the nation do that follows her teaching? Fall. Fall. Well, what must be the political condition of that country? A nation divided cannot stand. So what would be the condition of the nation just before it fell into the wine completely of Babylon? What would be the condition of the nation? Division. Division. Oh, but we don't have, not, not in 2021. Everybody's united in 2021. Is that right? No. There's never been seen in America the type of division on every level as we see today. Racial division, economic division, religious division, political division, division of all kinds. There's in the courtroom today about the riots that just went on. We see nothing but fanning the division. And this should be an indication to us. It says this report showed us the instability is coming in a U.S. intelligence community report on global water security released in what year? Said during the next 10 years, many countries important to the United States will experience water problems. In the next what? 10 years. 10 years. All right, let's see if we're good math students. We can add. <laughs> 2012. I add 10 to that. What does it give me? So then as we begin to approach 2022, leading up to 2025, we should see the, 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 the intensity increasing. We're in 2021. Do we see it? Yes or no? Yes. My friends, we're in the crisis years. These are but a few of the water tensions bubbling how? Globally. Are these thinking men right? Yes or no? They who are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations, they recognize that something great and decisive is what? That not America only, but the world. world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. This is where we are in Education 179, in 2021. This is where we are. Now, do we need to be doing something, yes or no? Yes. What do we need to be doing right now? Talk to me. What do we need to be doing? What do we need to be doing? We need to be studying as a family what's coming. Yes. And we need to be preparing as a family for what is coming. And then we need to be doing what in the community? Talk to me. We need to become an acquainted with those around us so that we can then share with them what we are learning on what is coming and how to prepare. Or they will say, you knew this. How come you didn't tell us? 
All of these things. Do you know that no other denomination knows what we know right here? And have put it together, the puzzle, from the Bible, to understand what this thing really means. It says, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation, depends upon what? Talk to me. The only way to help this country and to help any other country is by learning to help the family. We found out that God wants to do something with us. God wants to do something ready. What if I made mistakes, though? Can God help me, yes or no? Yes. You remember last week? Whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with God's help, do what? Rise, Rise above, above them. them. We're going to go deeper into our study this morning. But we found out again and again that just as the world is facing this crisis, the greatest thing that we can get now is called what? Water. What does God send down from the sky to give us water? Rain. rain. What is the name of the rain called? Talk to me. The early rain and the latter rain. This will solve the physical water problem and the spiritual water problem. I think that's a wonderful plan. What do you say? So before we go deeper to this, this morning, what we're studying, we started studying more fully last week, something called the science of receiving the rain. Today, we want to look at what is called the conclusion. The what? The conclusion. So we're still in that science, but now we must reach the conclusion. Now, as my teacher would say, they have something called a filibuster. He used to filibuster sometimes. And, <laughs> and what he meant was that as he's teaching, he recognizes that if he finishes uh, uh, right then, he cannot fully go where he wants to go because he doesn't have enough time. So if I'm teaching and I can only get half of the lesson in, you wouldn't fully understand it. He doesn't want to fully go into that part, but he's finished some of the past. So instead of going into a new lesson, he said, what I'm going to do is filibuster. You know what he meant? I'm going to fill out and give you a little more detail, but not go too much forward because then we wouldn't have enough time to cover it. Now, right now, I want to go next into the next part of the study, but I know that what's coming next week? What's going to happen next week? We're not going to be continuing the study next week. <laughs> That's the second Sabbath. So there's going to be a break in the study. And you know what could happen normally? If, we, if you're studying, you're studying, you're studying, you're lining, you're lining everything up, and then a break comes, what normally happens to the mind? The mind takes a break. <laughs> then you come back to the study, and guess what happens when you come back? You have what? Forgotten. The foundation of what you study. And so the Holy Spirit impressed me. Fill out more details of what we study. So that we can next week study with, uh, with Pastor. And then as we finish that study and come back the week after. We have several studies. In which we can now take the time and lay it out. Are you following what I'm getting at? Because we got to go into the most holy place. Amen. But we won't be able to understand it unless we go together. And I don't want us to miss it. So we're going to uh, give it what is called the conclusion. The what? Now, what does conclusion mean? So we're going to wrap up a little bit of our study on the early and latter rain. We've been studying it for about three months. Week by week, we've been studying this early and latter rain. We're going to wrap up that part of the study, and we're going to move back into where we are in the most holy place. But before we do, let's stop and pray. Let's say, Lord, as we go deeper, let's, go, let's get more of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we sense your presence. We're so thankful that in this time of emergency that you have prepared a solution. That you have not left us without hope, without help. That our families that are falling apart, marriages, homes, the raising of children, youth, young persons, society, everything is collapsing and falling. But Lord, there is a solution in Jesus Christ. And no matter what the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with your help, rise above them. We're told in Ministry of Healing 516. And it starts in the heart and in the home. Like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I plead, dear God, that you will put within us a desire to understand what's coming and how to prepare and to make those choices that would lead us into radical changes in our lives. Help us to understand the science, not just of what the rain is, not just of, of what the rain is about and the events that circulated, the purpose and the objective, but to learn how to receive the rain and to enter in so that our souls are watered and refreshed. Please, dear God, anoint us with your spirit. Abide with us now, we pray and we thank you. Remove every distraction. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, the third chapter. Are you ready to study? Yes or no? 
I think that our minds are watered and oiled and greased, and so we can get ready to uh, study a little bit more deeply. And Acts, the third chapter, Acts chapter 3. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen, Acts, the third chapter. Amen. Now, we have seen without a shadow of a doubt the evidences, the evidences that prove to us that we're reaching the end of time. Have we seen those evidences, yes or no? Yeah. We see the task before the church is too much for the church to fulfill. We're going to find out that in our human strength, we could try for a thousand years and never reach the world. For with our human strength, with the 25 million seven Adventists, uh, and not even 1% of that really ready. With the 7 billion plus people in the world, with the message that has to be developed in our own hearts and homes, we are not even close to doing that, but God has provided power so that we can reach the finish line. What is the power that God has provided? Talk to me, the rain. He has given us the power, the Holy Spirit, and what is known as the rain. Let's read this together. Testimonies to Ministers 174. This is one of the most powerful quotations on this point. It said, just prior to his leaving his disciples for the heavenly course, Jesus encouraged them, not discouraged them, but what? Encouraged them with the promise of what, everybody? The Holy Spirit. It says, this promise belongs as much to us as it did to them. Yet how rarely is it presented before the people? And it's reception spoken of in the church. We're backing up to understand what do we need to hear more about in the church? The reception of the Holy Spirit. It says, in consequence of this silence upon this most important thing, what promise do we know less about by its practical fulfillment than the rich promise of the gift of what everybody? The Holy Spirit. Whereby efficiency is to be given to all our spiritual labor. What's going to make us more effective? Holy Spirit. What's going to give us victory over sin? Holy Spirit. What's going to give us power to witness? Holy Spirit. What's going to change and revive and reform the church? Holy Spirit. What do we need the most of? Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit is casually brought into our discourses. Incidentally touched upon, accidentally as it were, incidentally. And this is all. Prophecies have been dwelt upon. Doctrines have been expounded. But that which is essential, that which is e, that which is essential to the church in order that they may. Someone says, well, the way to grow is simply baptize, baptize people. Is that the way to grow? You know you can baptize many people and still not grow. It says the way to grow in spiritual strength and efficiency in order that the preaching may carry conviction with it and souls be converted to God has been largely left out of the ministerial effort. In other words, we need the Holy Spirit. This subject has been set aside as if sometime in the future will be given to its consideration. Other blessings and privileges have been presented before the people until a desire has been awakened in the church for the attainment of the blessing promise of God. But the impression concerning what everybody has been that this gift is not for the church no. now. Maybe for the future, maybe for the past, but not now. But this is present truth. It says, but that at some time in the future, it will be necessary for the church to receive it. I submit it's necessary when? Yeah. Now. We need water when? Now. Yeah. Now this says, the spirit of God as it comes into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. What promise is less fulfilled in the church than that of the endowment of the? Here is our, now let's say that together. Here is our greatest, now we found out our greatest need. What is our greatest need? The Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, do we need to know how to receive him? Yes or no? It says, let the spirit of controversy be put away. Let us seek for the living testimony of the spirit of God. The teacher must be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We see now the importance of the Holy Spirit. Am I right? Do we see his urgency? Why we need it? When Jesus left this earth, he knew that the Holy Spirit was the greatest gift he could give to us. He was excited to tell us that the Holy Spirit was coming. And his goal was to teach his disciples how to receive it. Now, before we can get back into the science of how to receive the rain, because we found out that in order to receive the rain, there is a what? Special preparation. Do you know that it is not possible just to say, well, you know, Lord, I want the rain. And all of a sudden the rain falls upon you. You know, it doesn't work that way. In order to receive the rain, there is not just a preparation, there is a special preparation. And if we do not make that special preparation, we cannot receive the rain. Now, the early, uh, in the early rain, when they first started poured out in Pentecost, the disciples, they knew that the rain was coming. And when that rain was getting ready to be poured out of the sky, did they do something to prepare? Yes or no? Yes. 
Where did they go? They went up into something called an upper room. And in that upper room, their mind was thinking, we have to prepare because in a few short days, the rain is coming. Did everybody in the Jewish nation receive the rain? No, they did not. You know, it's not enough to be in the seven Adventist denomination to receive the rain. You know, it's possible to be in any denomination and never receive the rain. Now, my brothers and my sisters, it's not enough just to come to Richlands Church and think, well, I'm here. I'm under the teaching. I'm going to receive the rain. No, 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 no. There is a special one, preparation. And simply coming to church is not the preparation. Now, in order to know the preparation, we've got to come to church. But it's more than simply coming to church. As we come to church and study, the Bible tells us what the special preparation is. This is why we set up in this church B-T-I. What is B? Bible. What is T? Training. What is I? Institute. This is why every church should be a school. So that we can learn from God what is that special qualification or preparation. Now, I want to know it. What do you say? Now, we call that special preparation the science of receiving the rain. We'll come back to that. But before we do, we have to understand something of the context, something of the context of receiving it. Now, look at this. What is the artist depicting here? Who, who, who is this? Is this a baker with a, with a cap on his head? No. You know, somebody, when they see the white cap on the head, they think that just must be a baker. He's making bread. No, no. This is a high priest. Where is he? What, 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 what furniture is that in the sanctuary? What furniture is that? What's inside the Ark of the Covenant? The law. the law. What room is that Ark of the Covenant in? Outer court, holy place, or most holy place? When can the priest go into the most holy place? One day. What's the day called? Day of Atonement. What's the date of that day? Seven day. And you sound like Seven Day Adventists. And you know, it might have been, if we went back a few years ago, it may not be that we'll understand, but God is trying to teach us step by step. Watch. Now, what's he doing? He's sprinkling blood. That's right. He's sprinkling blood. How long has he been in there? From 1844. How long is that? 2021. How long is that? 170, 70 years this fall. It's 176 plus this fall. It'll be 177 years. Does he want to come out? Yes or no? Yes. Do you want him to come out? Yes. Not right now. Well, we should. We should want him to come out. But the average person doesn't want him to come out and there's a reason why we're not ready but he wants to come does the devil want him to come out no. why not he knows what that means if he comes out of the most holy place it's over <laughs> is it over brother jimmy <laughs> if he comes out of that most holy place it's over for him as long as he's in there he feels he still has a little hope but if he comes, if Jesus comes out of that most holy place, then you know nobody knows this except for seven heavens. And this is what God wants us to understand so we can share with others what's happening. We've got to bring Jesus outside of the what? Most holy place. Now, in order to bring him out, guess what we need? Brother Micah. Come on, Brother Micah. Talk to me this morning. In order to bring Jesus out of the most holy place, we need what? What do we need, Shiloh? We need rain. What do we need, Selah? We need rain. We need rain. What do we need, Amaya? Do you know that we can't do this unless we get the rain. Abigail? What do we need, Abigail? Rain. Yes. Little, even little Abigail, she's right on this thing. <laughs> now, so this tells us that what we need is rain. So the devil knows. Now, guess what the devil knows? If they don't get the early and latter rain, they will never reach a place that can bring Jesus out of the most holy place. So then what will be the prime objective of you or the devil? Stop them from receiving the So then we need to find out what's the strategy. Now, now, even though you may not know the details yet, what is the name of the strategy, the, the last strategy of Satan to keep Jesus in the most holy place and they stop the seven minutes church from preparing to get the rain? What's the name of the strategy? The Omega of apostasy. Now that means later on we have to find out and we got to study through Daniel 11, Revelation 17, everything to understand out what the Omega is. But, we, but that's not a study. But the point is, that's what the devil's going to use. Now, let's go a little further. We found out that this is the real issue. And if Jesus comes out of the most holy place on time, the devil's in trouble. Now, in order to understand this, we got to go backwards in order to go forwards to reach the conclusion. You remember I use this illustration many times. You get stuck 
Don't forget this. If you ever get stuck, I've helped many people out of being stuck. Some people even in this room. <laughs> but if you ever get stuck, what is the first thing you do when you get stuck? Don't, don't, don't gun it. Don't gun it. Don't do that. I'm saying, look. So, so, <laughs> but hey, well, if you see somebody again, say, please, don't, don't do that. <laughs> you, 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 you're just, you're just going to go deeper. What do you do? You go back. And then slowly you begin to go forward. So in our study, what do we need to do this week? First, we need to do what? Back up. And then we're going to go forward a little bit more slowly to make sure that we understood that which we study to reach the conclusion. Amen? That's what we want to do. Now, question. Before we go deeper, does anybody have any questions of anything we have studied concerning this rain that was here in our class? Does anyone have any questions concerning what we have studied about the rain? Because as we study these deep subjects, I want to make sure you always have an opportunity. We're in class, not just preaching. We're in school. And in school, the teacher asks questions and wants these students to give what? Answers. Answers. And so I'm looking at you. You have your notes. You have your folders. You ha you're in class. I want to make sure that your questions were answered. Did you have any questions? Okay, I saw, I saw a hand. Uh, let me come over here first and I'll come right back to you. Mother Davis. What was the three steps we had learned last week? Okay, we'll come... You got one step. We got, we got to get you more than one step. That's right. <laughs> we need all the steps in order to get this rain. We'll come back to that. That's a very good question. But we'll come back to that. All right. Uh, that's going to take us a little bit uh, forward, but we'll come back to that. Sister? My question, I'm a little con I, don't, I guess I'm having a little confusion. Um, so I know that we received the form of rain first, and it's like how, you, how the disciples received the form of rain. And, then the and speak a little louder so everybody can hear too, please. The latter church received the latter rain. Yes. Um, Okay, now, now, now this a good question. Uh, I'm going to uh, kind of look at it a little bit. Let me, let me show you something from the Bible. Go to your Bible first. Let's look at this. Let's go to the book of, uh, uh, to the book of Zechariah. And we want to notice what the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 9. Well, not Zechariah. Let's go to John. Let's go to John first. Let's go to John 14. Excuse me. I'll repeat the question. Go to John 14. Let's go to John 14. Now, what the question was... In short, was the early, the, the early rain and the latter rain, she's trying to understand a little bit better. And she was saying the early rain didn't fall until after Christ left. But the disciples, they were working miracles prior to the, uh, to, to the early rain being poured out upon them. And so what was happening? What, this is basically what the question was. Uh, where did I tell you to go? John, John uh, please forgive me. Uh, let's go into Luke chapter 9. Let's go into Luke chapter 9. Please forgive me. Luke chapter 9. So a thousand things running through my brain, but we can't go through all of them. So let's go to Luke. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 9. And notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Luke 9. Sister Melissa, would you read that for us, please? Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. He gave them what? Power. Now, who's giving them power right now? Jesus. Jesus. All right. In other words, to work miracles. So Jesus himself, while he was there, gave them power to do something in the name of Jesus. You'll notice everything they did, they'll first start in the name of Christ, while he was there. Now, Jesus dies on the cross. He says, I'm going to heaven. Now, if he's gone, how are they going to do it? Through him. So that means that in order to do the same miracles, they need the same person to be with them. Remember Peter, he's trying to walk on water. As long as Jesus was with him, he's with Jesus, he can walk. All of a sudden, he takes his eyes off Jesus, what happens? He can't do the miracle anymore. No so they never had power of themselves. It was always through their connection with Christ. Now Christ is going back to heaven. How are they going to work these miracles now? They needed another comforter to do for them what Christ did while he was on the earth. But the limitation was, remember in John 14, remember what Jesus said? In John 14, look what this, the Bible says. In John 14, now remember this point now. Watch what it says in John 14. And we want to pick up in John 14, beginning in verse 16. John 14 and verse 16. What does the Bible say? Very good question, my sister. In verse 16, what does it say? Now back up to verse 12, verse 12. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall what? Talk to me. He do also, and what? 
greater works than these shall he do because I go. So how is it that he's going, but they're going to do greater works? Now, remember, what did we find out last week that Jesus did in the plan of redemption? He took on a body. Remember that? Yes. Now, before he took on that body, how much was he encumbered with that he couldn't be in every place? How many uh, was, could he be in every place? What do we call that? Omnipresence. The word was omnipresent. But when he became flesh and dwelt among us, he took on a body in which that omnipresence he sacrificed for us. Now, in that body, he's working miracles, but he cannot be every place at the same time. Am I right? Yes. But guess what he says when he goes? He says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to send you a comforter who is not going to be fettered or bound by humanity. He's going to come with no modified energy. Who is that representative? What's his name? The, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The third person of the Godhead. He's going to come not with the body of flesh. He's going to come still as God with the presence of God, able to help everyone at the same time, all the time, all the power everywhere at one time. I said, praise God. Amen. The plan of redemption needed all three members of the Godhead in order to work. If God had remained God, no sacrifice. If everyone had made the sacrifice, no one to help after the sacrifice. Wow. So what we find out is the plan was laid this way and the Godhead works in perfect unison. I say it's a wonderful plan. So the Holy Spirit was then to come in the early rain, poured out after Christ left to give them the ability to do the miracles and the works that need to happen internally that they could not do. Does that make it clear to you? It Praise God. All right. OK, now quick, let's ask. Uh, but remember, uh, in take, he wasn't he wasn't. Uh, and, and even if he was taking the form of an angel, he had not made a sacrifice. So he he did not bound himself in any way that came when he said a body has now prepared for me. So he, he could be everything all in one at one time. The word he was everything everywhere, just like the, the father, just like the Holy Spirit. So it, it, you can see their shape, their form, but they can be everywhere at the same time. So it's not the same uh, situation as becoming a hum, human being humanity in a body you know an angel does not have flesh and blood an angel also is a spirit but a human being see an angel could walk straight through this wall <laughs> and you walking with him you walk with him, boom you, you be <laughs> but an angel is not made of flesh and bones and blood like we are he is a spirit god is a spirit the angels are ministering spirits but the humanity is not a ministering spirit and as a result, they we are to be ministers but our bodies are in the flesh you understand what i'm getting at okay praise god now any other question? Any other question? Anything we study in the early night of rain, we want to make sure we understand it. Now, I know I have, we haven't been that good of a teacher for you not to have any question. You know? <laughs> i tell you what. If you have any questions, I have some questions. <laughs> See, a teacher has to be prepared for you. That if you don't have a question, then the teacher needs to do what? Have some questions for you to make sure that you understand. Is that right, Brother Tim? <laughs> We got to give them some questions. Is that right? <laughs> All right. Here we go. Question number one. There is something called the game of life. Yes. Satan is playing the game of life for every soul. God wants us to win. He says that we are to win Christ. That means we're going to win. We're in a game. Now, my brother says the question. How many quarters does the game? Now, basketball, how many quarters? Four. Football, how many quarters? Four. The game of life. Three, Three quarters. Yeah. Are you sure? How do you know that there are only three quarters in the game of life? How do you know? Based on the places of the sanctuary, Sister Davis. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, how do we know that? What, what does the sanctuary tell us? Thy way, O oh God. So if you want to understand God's way, God's plan, the life that God has made, then you go to that sanctuary. How many places? Three. So the game of life has how many quarters? Talk to me. Represent it. By the events of the outer court, the events of the holy place, and the events of the most holy place. Good. What event marked halftime in the game of life? Crucifixion elder. Now, you know, you can't speak now. I'm putting the gag on you now. Why? Now, remember, there are three quarters. Where do you get a half 
after the first quarter. You don't have to get a half. It's not a half. You know, it shouldn't be a quarter and a half, at least or some of you three. three. You know, four quarters, the, the second quarter, halftime comes after the second quarter. Am I right? right? So how are we getting that at the cross? And where did the cross take place? Where did the cross take place? Oh, On earth. earth. What, 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 what room in the sanctuary? The outer, the outer court. court. So the outer court antitypically represents the earth. The sanctuary antitypically represents heaven. So my question is, how in the world could only one quarter, it appears, be played and we get halftime in 31 A.D.? How do we get halftime in 31 A.D.? How do we, how, 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 what makes it halftime looking at this cross? What, what makes the cross halftime? Because we want to make sure we understand this. All right. All right. I see. I see Sister Debbie. Talk to me, Sister Debbie. The work of the Lamb on earth was finished. Are you hearing this, my brother? Yes. It sounds like you've been studying, Sister Debbie. Yes. Praise God. So, now, why is that? Now, now, no, you can't talk anymore now, Sister Debbie. <laughs> now on this question. You, 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 let me, you, you let me in on something. Elder Smoke, you can't talk on this one yet either. <laughs> now, why is that significant that the work of a Lamb was done in relationship to halftime in the quarters? Why is that significant? Because there are two works that need to be done. There are two what? Works. Now, what are the two works symbolized by? Jesus symbolized by a lamb. lamb. And Jesus symbolized by a priest. priest. We found out that in the sanctuary, the outer court is the work of the lamb. The holy place is the work of the priest. The most holy place is the work of the priest. So we find now, although there's three places, three quarters, only two different works. So when the first work is done, then what happens? Half time. Are you with me? So if you can show me when the first work was done, then I show you when half time is. Because there's only one more work after that. Now, somebody other than Sister Debbie... And other than Elder Smokey, tell me. Now you, now, now you, now you know, you know, you can't speak on this road. <laughs> now you tell me, someone other than that, when or how do we hear the next time when the other half is finished? Mm -mm. When Revelation? Yes, Micah. Talk to me, Micah. Well, not the angel, but that's very good. You're right on point. An angel, when God says it is done. Now, where in the Bible do we see Jesus saying it is done on the outer court, in the outer court? Where do we see Jesus saying it's done in the outer court? On the cross. John 19. It is finished. What does he say? Now, if it's from the throne, then who is talking? The one who's sitting where? On that throne. Who is that? God. Now, watch what he says. Continue. Now, you know that word, it is done, is the exact same Greek word, it is finished. Same word, same, just translated, it is done here. It's translated, it is finished in John 19. It's the exact same expression. So in other words, exactly what he said on the cross, he says again in Revelation 16. Exact words. What does that tell us? Was he, did he forget he said it over 2,000 years ago? Is that what happened? No. Or was there another work that had to be done? So there was a work in the outer court that had to be done, and there's a work in the temple and the sanctuary that has to be done. A work as a lamb and a work as a priest. So on the cross when he said it is finished, he meant my work as a lamb is done, but my work as a priest had just begun. So then that means the cross then finished half of the work thereby bringing us to what everybody? Half time. Does it make sense? Half of the work was done here in this outer court. This sacrifice. The second half of the work will be done here in these two compartments. When he finishes the work in the most holy place, the work will be finished and Jesus may what? Come. Now, what is the last thing? Because we're talking about bringing Jesus out of the most holy place. What has to happen to bring Jesus out of the most holy place? Go to Acts. What book did I say? Go to Acts chapter 3. Go to Acts 3. We're going to find out that this right here, no other denomination knows. No other person knows except for a little group of people called seven Adventists. This is why the devil hates you. Look at Acts chapter 3. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 3. 
And we want to begin in verse 19, Acts 3, beginning in verse 19. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. All right. Would you read that for us, uh, Brother Tony? Acts 3, verse 19, please. We're going to the book of Acts, chapter 3. And we want to notice what the Bible says, 19. Now, what we're looking for is to find out what does Jesus have to finish before he can come back the second time in that sanctuary. Acts 3, verse 19. What does the Bible say in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19? Are we all there? Amen. Good. All right. Acts 3, 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 20. And now he's going to send who? Jesus. Now if he sends Jesus, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to come. He's going to send Jesus Christ, which before was what? Verse 21. Whom the heaven must what? Of how many? All his holy prophets when? So all the prophets from the beginning of the world spoke of this. They said that the heaven must hold on to Jesus until he accomplishes a certain work. Why hasn't Jesus come back from heaven the second time? The heaven must receive him, must keep him until something is done. But after that thing is done, the father will send Jesus. So what has to happen before the father can send Jesus? I heard someone say it, but I want someone else. I heard somebody whispered over here. I want the whole, it should, it should just be able to sing in chorus together. But in the text, text, text. I, see, we've got to always build from the Bible. Always build from the Bible. The blotting out of sins. Now see, I can tell sometimes by the way you say it to me that you don't fully understand what you're saying yet. So I want to make sure you fully understand what you're saying. Let's back up again. Look at it. Acts 3. Watch now. Verse 19. It says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your, what everybody, sins may be what? Now, so the sins have to be what? Blotted out. Then it says, that's going to bring the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. We'll come back to that. Then it says, now once the sins are blotted out, what's he going to do in verse 20? And he shall what? So God, the Father, is going to send Jesus once he sees that our sins have been what? Blotted out. But now look at the text again, more carefully. It says, Jesus will, uh, 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 he will send Jesus Christ from before it was preached unto you, verse 21, whom the heaven must what? Receive. Now what does receive mean? Keep, brother Jimmy, brother Jimmy. You can see he's, like, he's working the Holy Spirit, putting the tooth in his part. Now look at this thing now. The heaven must receive Jesus until a certain work is done. What is the work that has to be done before the Father can send Jesus? The blotting out of sins. So if sins are not blotted out, Jesus cannot come out of the most holy place. So then Satan's goal is to keep the sin from being blotted out. That's the only thing keeping Jesus in the most holy place. That's the only thing. Now give me another name for the blotting out of sin. The cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel 8, 14 says, and we studied this verse by verse. And he said unto me unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But the sanctuary was cleansed not on any other day. The sanctuary was cleansed only on one day. What was the day called? The day. So the day of atonement was the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary or the blotting out of. When that work is accomplished, Jesus may come. So then this is what we have to understand. And seventh day Adventists came on the scene with this understanding. They came on the scene understanding that our church was brought into existence to show the last part of the work of Jesus. Other churches know a little bit about what he did on the earth about the cross. Notice I said a little bit. They know a little bit about what he did on earth as a cross, but they know almost nothing of what he's done in this sanctuary. And in the most holy place, they know absolutely zero. Now, they may have read the words, they may have heard something said, they may even use the expressions, but do not know what it means. Is it possible to say something but not understand? Oh, yeah. It's possible. 
Now, my brothers and my sisters, this is the difference between Seventh-day Adventism and Christianity as a whole. We're Christians with a further understanding of Christ, provided that we get that understanding. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this says, the heaven must receive until the restitution of all things, until this blotting out of sins. Now, let's read this together. The Great Controversy 49. It says, the intercession of what? Christ in man's behalf. Where? In the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his what? Upon the what does that mean? As essential. What does that mean? Equally important. So what is more important, the sanctuary and his ministry there or the death of the cross? They're equal. They're equal. It says, by his death, he did what? He didn't finish the work. By his death, he did what? Began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete where? Amen. That's why he says it's finished up there. See, on the ground, on the earth, in the outer court, he said it's finished because he began the finishing work, finishing that part of the earth. But he went to heaven now because there's a part of that work that's still left undone. Now, my brothers and sisters, what separates us from Jesus? Is it the thousand, uh, millions of miles? What separates Sin. Isaiah 59 tells us that sin separates from God. So in order to end that separation and bring God back to us, something has to be done to what? Sin. Now, what is this? Anybody know what that looks like? That looks like a celebration there. What type of celebration? Halftime. Now you and I know that based on the sanctuary, that halftime celebration took place in 31 AD in heaven. They had a celebration after the cross. When the first fruits were offered, this celebration took place. Now, my brothers and sisters, what must happen in order for Jesus, our high priest, to win the game? What must happen? Talk to me. What must happen? Uh, there, there, we talked about two great things. In order for Jesus to win the game. See, the game is not over. In order for Jesus to win the game, two things has to happen. Number one, what has happened? Talk to me. Number one, talk to me. What, what's number one? But you want to find out he can't blot out sins just to blot out sins. Something has to happen before he can blot out sins. And we're going to, we'll, we'll see it. Yes. So we must be brought back to a what? To a what? Sinless state. Number two, what's the second thing? Talk to me. What's the second thing? This gospel must go to how much of the world? Now, what do we need in order to do this? Talk to me. What do we need? We need the rain. It says the, the glad times of our risen Savior was carried to the utmost bounds in the heavenly world. The church beheld converts flocking to her from how many directions? Believers were what? This was the result of Pentecost. It says... These scenes are to be repeated with greater power. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be what? More, More abundant. So we found out that this can only happen as a result of the rain. This is what happened on the day of atonement. They were brought back to the sinless state. The entire congregation were brought here. Let's read this together. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease where? And the sanctuary above are to not sit, but what? Stand in the sight of a holy God. How? Without a mediator. Now, why is that? Go to 1 John chapter 2. Let's go to 1 John 2. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. It says they were to, it says they were to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Question, tell me. Why is it important to be able to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator? What, what does that have to do with the... End of the game. What does that have to do with bringing Jesus out of the most holy place? Standing before the sight of a holy God without a mediator. What, is, what, what relationship? Now anybody can talk. What is the relationship with that? Why do, does someone have to uh, be, uh, as it says here, why does someone have to be prepared to stand or brought to a sinless state? What is that, the relationship between that and Jesus leaving the most holy place? What? what? Now, that's true. We have to be without sin and be able to stand. But what does that have to do with Jesus leaving the most holy place? Because the key is we got to bring Jesus out of the most what? Holy place. So what is the relationship 
between us being brought back to a sinless state and carrying this message to the world and Jesus leaving the most holy. What's the relationship between those two points? Yep. This is his work. His work is if we sin to do what? Forgive us of that sin and then bring us to a place where we stop sinning. If we are still sinning, we still need a priest who ever liveth to what? Make intercession for us and can save us to the uttermost if we come. Hebrews 7.25. So the priest is there to help us, to aid us, to give us power and grace to forgive us, to correct us, to instruct us, to guide us, to give us power so that we can live above it. But if a sincere believer is still falling into sin, then the priest must remain until his work is done. So my brothers and sisters, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We see the principle right here. Uh, Amaya, if you read that for us. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, please. What's he writing unto us? Continue. So what is all of the Bible trying to bring us to the place of? Well, we stop sinning. What's the punctuation point? Period. So he's saying the Bible is trying to bring us to a place through Jesus where we can stop sinning. Period. That's the plan. Yet, that's not where we are right now. So what does God do? He makes a provision. A plan to bring us back to that state. Now let's see the plan. Continue, mind. What's the plan? If condition, you don't have to do this. But if what? So if we sin, we have a what? Advocate. Who is the advocate? Jesus. What is another name for advocate? Priest. Priest. Intercessor. Lawyer. Mediator. So Jesus is a mediator as long as we are sinning. So in order for him to finish that work and come back to the earth the second time to crush Satan's head, you know what he has to do? He has to bring somebody back to the place where they no longer need him in that capacity. Amen. So then what place would a sinner have to be in where they no longer need a priest in that capacity? A sinless, a sinless state. So my brothers and sisters, do you see? That in order for Jesus to finish the work and come back the second time, he must do something inside of us to bring us back to perfection, to a sinless state. Can we see that, yes or no? Yes. It says, their robes must be what? Spotless. Their character must be what? Purified from sin. How? By the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and you never have to do anything yourself. Is that what it says? Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle. How? So can we do this by ourselves? No. Will God do it for you? No. We have to do it how? Together. That's relationship. Amen. It says, while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed or cleansed or blotted out from the sanctuary, there is to be a what? In other words, a special preparation. It says there's to be a special preparation or purification of what? Putting away of sin. Where? Among God's people. So while Jesus is getting ready to blot out sins up there, what's happening to the people of God down here? They're saying they're looking for sins in their life that they can bring to Jesus so that he can take it from them. So my brothers and my sisters, it says this work is what? More in the what? So it shows us that this putting away of sin, putting away of sin is a work. Does it have a symbol? Yes or no? Yes. How is it represented? Three the three angels messages. So it says, this work is more clearly presented in the message of Revelation 14. Now, if you get to the end of the third angel's message, do you know how the third angel closes his message in Revelation 14? He closes it thus in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Who is he talking about? The church. 
here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that are trying to keep God's commandments, but keep falling and repenting and slippering and slobbering. Is that what he says? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. That's how the third angel presents and finishes his message. By the production of a people who can live in a time of trouble against the beast, his image, his mark, and the son-in-law, and the persecution, all that, and still stand. They would rather die than sin. They love God so much. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what symbolizes. Now, watch. Second section of message 387. Now, everything I'm telling you is going to come back on a test. We're not just telling you something. We're not just showing you this. There are pieces we're putting out that we've got to put together in this puzzle. And second selected message 387, it says, during the past 50 years of my life, I've had a precious opportunities to obtain an experience. Let's read this together. I have what? Had an, not just information, but a what? She had a personal experience in what? The first, second, and third angels' messages. Someone said, well, I didn't do that. I didn't see any angels flying by. The angels are represented as what? Flying in the midst of heaven. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? Where? Revelation 14, verse what? 6 through 12. It says, proclaiming to the world a message of warning. And having a direct bearing upon what? The people, not just the dead, but the people what? Living in the last days of the church history. Are we in the last days? Yes or no? It says, let's read this together. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a... So the three angels are a symbol. The three angels are a symbol. Who gave this symbol? Who gave this symbol? God. Right? right. The Revelation chapter 1 says that all this came from God, sent through his angel, signified to his servant John. So in Revelation 14, this symbol came from God to do what? Right. Represent the people of God. So the church of God have been given by God a symbol. Is that right? It says they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are what? So the people of God, God's church have been given a symbol characterizing the work that they are to do. Are we together? It says in harmony with the universe. Now, now please don't write that down. Circle that. This will come back on the test. This is serious, brothers and sisters. It says, men and women, enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three messages in their what? Do you know that God wants you and I to be one of these three angels? I remember I was on a plane one time and we were talking with a person sitting beside us and we ended up starting talking. And I tell you, if you get within six feet, you're liable to be hit with the gospel. <laughs> and so that person's right beside me. We start talking. And all of a sudden, we slipped in. <laughs> The coming events of what was happening. We start talking about what's going on in the world. And before you know, boom, the Bible was out. We start talking about revelation and what was coming. And then the person looked over and said, who are you? I said, I'm an angel flying in the midst of heaven. And I said, it, it, it helped that we were flying too. You know? <laughs> now, my brothers and my sisters, but even if we were on the ground, we would still be flying. That represents the exalted nature of the message. The flying meant that it's, it's worldwide, it's extent. You can see about when you lift something up, the purpose of lifting it up is so it can be seen. Jesus said, if I be what? Lift it up, that I will draw all men. It's, it's showing the worldwide extent of the work. That's what it meant when it said angels flying in the midst of heaven. Now, so we can begin to see now that what we need to accomplish this is the Holy Spirit to bring it to us the latter rain. That latter rain will finish the work. How many quarters does the game of life have? Talk to me. Three. Three. Uh, number, what was the second? The second question was, uh, when did halftime come? 31. 31 AD. Now, after halftime in the last quarter, what two great things must happen in order for Jesus to win the game? We just, this is a review now. What two things must happen? Talk to me. We must be brought back to a what? Sinless state. And then this gospel must be what? For a witness unto all nations. And then shall the? So no end of the game until those two things happen. Now, what must come to the church in order for these three, two things to be accomplished? The, holy the rain, the, rain. the Holy Spirit. What are the names of the two types of rain? Early rain and latter rain. All right. Early rain, latter rain. Now, what is the early rain to do for us? 
What is the early rain to do for us? And this is this is key. What is the early rain to do for us? Now, we're not talking about how to receive it. I won't close on get ready to close on that. But what is the early rain to do for us? Because remember now. See, this is why we have to understand the context of the game first. See, if, if, if we're not brought back to a sinless state, Jesus can't leave the most holy place. If he doesn't leave the most holy place, Satan's head cannot be crushed at the end of the day of atonement. Satan is trying to keep us in a sinless state, so a sinless, sinful state, so that Christ can't leave the most holy place. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Satan understands this, but Jesus has provided a gift to help us to get back to a sinless state. Remember, remember we found out, remember that gift? Look at this. I'm going to read this one. Let me just read this one. Let's read this one. It says... Desire six seventy one. It says the spirit was to give was given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. In other words, the cross would mean nothing to us without the Holy Spirit. It says the power of evil had been strengthening for what centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was what. Amen. Look at how easy it gets us to sin today. It was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome. How? Only through the mighty agency of the third person of the... Who is that third person? The Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, this is why the devil will try to uh, create a movement that will eliminate the Holy Spirit. Yeah, people call themselves present truth, but no Holy Spirit. Foolishness! The third person of the Godhead who will come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of what? Divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. Spirit that causes the cross to be effectual in our lives. It is by the spirit that the heart is made what? Yeah. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine, what's that next word? Power to do what? Overcome, how much? All hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon the church. What do we need to get victory over the sins of our lives? The Holy Spirit. The, it says... The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. Of the spirit, Jesus said, he shall glorify me. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love. So the spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. That's why it's called the character fruit of the spirit. It says the very image of God is to be reproduced where? In humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of so that means the Holy Spirit is designed to bring us back to perfection to restore in us the image of God to give us victory over cultivated and hereditary tendencies to evil it is the spirit that does this so we found out from that what then is the work of the early rain To give us the strength to withstand the devil, yes. So we can be able to, well, get the seal of God. And, no, have the early, have the little rain. Now, no, we, we, we're staying just with the early rain right now. That's, that's true. Now, we, you, you're doing good. But what we want to do is just focus particularly right here on the early rain. What is the early rain's real goal to accomplish? The uh, end result is what I'm speaking of now. That's not the steps process, but this is true. This is true. You're right. But not in, not in result. Okay. And now he does do that. He does do that. But, as a, but what is the objective? Now, remember now. Remember, remember this. Remember this. Remember this. Anything that God does. Anything that God does, it is in dealing with sin. The, the Bible says they should call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. sin. So what God is doing right now in the plan of redemption is dealing with this problem. This is the problem. The reason why we're separated from God, not in heaven now, because of what? Sin. What makes us fall? Sin. What's keeping us from having a relationship with God? Sin. What's keeping us from being a friend of God? Sin. What's keeping us from receiving the Holy Spirit? Sin. So we see that this is the issue. It's not even Satan. Do you know that sin is more of an enemy than Satan? Now, my brothers and my sisters, so what I want us to see right now is in dealing with the early rain, you're not dealing with the early rain unless you understand what the early rain does to sin. How it enables us and relates to us in context of sin. Are you following what I'm getting at? So now it's going to do many things. And we're going to talk about that before we close. But my main point right now is what is the end result of being filled with the early rain? What is the early rain to do for the sinner 
to know to know that the early rain has accomplished his work. Now, not the blood, not a sin yet, but early rain. Now, let's let's read this. Let's read this. Signs of the time. This is what the early rain is to do. This is the best explanation. July 23rd, 1902, paragraph 14. I love this quotation. Let's read it together. Those who believe on Christ and obey his commandments are not under bondage to God's law. For to those who believe and obey, his law is not a law of bondage, but of what? Liberty. Liberty. Everyone. How many? Everyone. Who believes on Christ. Everyone who relies on the keeping of a risen. Now, what is the keeping power of risen Savior? And you shall receive power after that the Holy, Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit is this keeping power. Now, watch now. Of a risen Savior that has suffered the penalty pronounced upon the transgressor. Everyone who does what? Resist temptation. And in the midst of evil, copies the pattern given him where? Will, not through their own works, but through what? Faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ become a what? Now, do you remember? It is the spirit that makes us a partaker of the divine nature. It says they will become a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Now, watch what happens when the spirit makes us a partaker of the divine nature. What is the result? Everyone who receives the fullness of the early rain. Let's read the last sentence together. What did it say? Everyone who by faith does what? Obeys God's commandments will reach a condition of what? Sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. That's Seventh day Adventism right there. This is what the message came into existence for. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch. So then, the early rain is to do what? Bring us back to affection. To a sinless state. That's what the earth rains to do. To bring us back to a sinless state. Now you know what many people are doing? They're waiting for the latter rain to do that. You know what's going to happen? A terrible mistake. Waiting for the God to do something for us. That he will never do under the latter rain. Now my brothers and sisters. Now I want to ask you a question. Most people if they even know about being brought back to a sinless state. Thinks that that's it right here. Like. Why would you need a ladder rain if you already brought back to a sinless state? <laughs> Why would you need a ladder rain if you already been brought back to a sinless state? Is that a good question? Yes or no? I'm coming. I'm coming to you, Sister Teresa. I'm coming to you in just a moment. Now watch this now. Ah, I didn't. I didn't okay, Sister Teresa. Isn't the ladder rain for completely blotting out the sin? It, it, it blots out sin. Yes, uh, but, but 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 why? Why would I need the latter rain to, if, if the early rain brought me back to a sinless state, why can't my sins be blotted out? Just with the early rain then. Like, why? Uh, Micah. Because Adam and Eve were sinless, but they weren't sealed. Come on, Micah! <laughs> look, look, look what the quotation says. Look what the quotation says. That boy must be a seven heaven somewhere. Now, watch what it says. Now, everyone who would by faith obey God's commandments will reach what? The condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. Was Adam in a sinless state? Yes. Was Lucifer in a sinless state? Yes. But did Lucifer fall? Yes. Did Adam fall? Yes. Did Eve fall? Yes. So then there's something more that has to happen to us once we're brought back to a sinless state. Something still must happen to us a little bit more. A whole lot more. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. But most people think that's it. Soon you get, I, I'm, I'm brought back to where Adam was before transgression. But listen, once you get there, then the Son of His church wants to take us to a place where no man has gone before. Oh. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> no one has gone here before. Yeah. No one. No one who has ever sinned to be brought to a place, not only there, we're going to go where Adam never went. Now, my brothers and my sisters, so tell me then, once we're brought back to this in the state, that's the purpose of the early rain, then what will the latter rain do for us that the early rain has not done? Talk to me, Sister Davis. I see you bubbling over. <laughs> it will settle us. Let's go, let's go to the Bible. Let's, go, let's see that from the Bible. Go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter in our Bible. Go to 1 Peter. Very good. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Watch now. You're going to 1 Peter Chapter 5, and we want to notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5. 
First Peter 5. Now, we'll go to the screen. I'm going to come to First Peter 5 in just a moment, but go, to your, go, go in your, uh, look to the screen for a moment. I'll read a quotation. After you get the First Peter 5, now I want to take you to the screen. You're going to First Peter chapter 5. And we'll notice what the Bible says in First Peter 5 in just a moment. All right. You're in First Peter 5. You're there. Can I just look at the screen for a moment? This is Faith I Live By 287. Faith I Live By 287, FLB. Let's read this together. It says, just as soon as the people of God are what? Sealed. In their foreheads, it is not as any seal or mark that can be seen, but a what? Settling into the truth. How? Both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Now, Adam was sinless, but guess what? He was moved from that sinless state. Lucifer was sinless, but he was moved from that sinless state. In order for you and I to go through this last crisis, not only must we be brought back to a sinless state, but we must then be settled where we cannot be what? Moved. You can smell that food, that sinful food, and you're not moved by that thing. You know, he used to have a cartoon where the smell came in and took the man by the nose and he's just floating <laughs> through. Or, or the, the man played the music, the piper played the music in the ear, and he just, people just follow him everywhere he go. You know, the devil has that type of effect upon us. We can't resist his music. His food, his clothing, his entertainment, his amusement, his relationships, his perversions. And God is saying, I'm going to bring you to a place. Not only will I purify you from that, but you won't be moved anymore by it. You will be settled. This is the purpose of the latter rain. Now look at the Bible. First Peter 5. Look what the Bible says in First Peter 5, beginning in verse 9. First Peter 5, verse 9. Let's read that together. First Peter 5, verse 9. I can't let you read this by yourself. This is too good. We're going to read it together. Verse 9, what does it say? It says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are where? But now watch verse 10, what God wants for us. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have what? For a while. What's he going to do? But after he makes you perfect, what's he going to do? Continue. Establish you. What else? Strengthen you. What else? Talk to me. Settle you. So he's going to bring you back to perfection. And then he's going to do what? Settle you. Is that what the prophet says? Yes or no? Everything this prophet says, this Bible says. And everything the Bible says, this prophet says, exact words. I tell you, it's a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, when everything you believe comes from the word of God. Now. This tells me that once you now settle, what does that mean to settle? Anybody know what that means to settle? You're not moved? How long? Forever. Go to 1 Kings 8. Let me show you how long settling works. When something is really settled, 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8. Let me show you how long that the guy wants to do this for. In 1 Kings 8, look what the Bible says in 1 Kings 8. And Sister Minnie, if you read this for us loud and clear, 1 Kings chapter 8. I love when Sister Minnie reads for us. 1 <laughs> Kings chapter 8, look what the Bible says. And we try to understand the process, the timing of settling. Verse 13, 1 Kings 8 verse 13. What does it tell us? I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. What type of house? Continue. Settle. A what place? Settle. A settled place. Well, let's see when a place is settled. What, what, what is it called? Let's continue. A settled place for thee to abide in forever. How long? Forever. Now, remember, it's talking about, this is the prayer that Solomon is praying, dedicating the sanctuary. Because remember, there was another type of sanctuary. In the wilderness, they took that wilderness sanctuary everywhere they go. It was a movable sanctuary. And the wilderness was packed up. It was moved from place to place. Everywhere they went through the 40 years, they took the sanctuary with them. There was an order for everything to leave. But once God brought them into the promised land, he said, I don't want a movable sanctuary. I don't want one that can go back and forth. He said, I want a place that is going to be a permanent structure that will no longer be moved, how? From place to place, but will stay there where I can dwell there forever. Amen. That was a type of you and me. Amen. So my brothers and my sisters, how long was that place to stand there? What does the Bible say? When it was settled, how long was it to be settled? A settled place. So then what is the latter rain to do? Once we have been brought back to sinless, what would the latter rain do? Settle, settle us in that sinless perfection. How long? Forever. Forever. Then sin will not rise a second time. 
No more need of a priest. Because it will never come back again. Amen. So then if I don't get the latter rain, we're still in danger of falling back into sin. Yes. Are you following? Yes. And the devil knows this. So the early rain brings us back to perfection to ascend the state. And the latter rain does what? Settles us in perfection where we can never be what? We would rather die than then we're ready for the seal. Then we're ready for the latter rain. Then we're ready for the loud cry. Then we're ready for the priest to stand up. Then we're ready for Jesus to come out of that most holy what? Place. Are you with me? Yes. But I want to ask you a question. What can the latter rain do for us if we have not let the early rain do its job? Nothing. Look at this now. Many have in a great measure failed to receive the... Give me another name for the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the... So many people, now let, let's speak in a, in, a, in, a, in a state where we can understand it. Many people are thinking that even if they don't get sinless under the early rain, that the latter rain is going to make up and make them sinless. When the riches abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a what? Terrible mistake. The work that God has begun in the human heart and given his light and knowledge must be continually going forward. Every individual must realize his own necessity. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and what? Cleanse. Why? For the indwelling of the spirit. Relationship between sin and the spirit. It says it was by the confession and what? Now those names should sound familiar to us. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring or the reign of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. The same work only in a greater degree must be done when? Now. Now remember there are degrees of the early reign. More and more until the perfect day. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 verse 18 the latter rain ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that does what? Prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has what? Fallen. There will be no the green blade will not spring Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain will bring no seed to perfection. So unless the early rain has brought us to that perfected state, then the latter rain cannot settle that perfection. This is what the statement is telling us. Now, my brothers and my sisters, in plain language, what will the latter rain do for us if we don't receive the early rain? Nothing. Well, it'll do something worse than nothing. It will settle us in sin. So he's going to settle you wherever you are. Let him that is filthy, let him be filthy. Still. Him that is holy, let him be holy. Still. That's the result of the, uh, of the latter rain. The latter rain has done his work. So my brothers and my sisters, Satan wants us to remain sinful until the outpouring of the latter rain. Then he says they cannot be moved. They'll never make it. Now my brothers and my sisters, can we wait then for the latter rain? We should be getting the fullness of the early rain when... Now, now I saw a hand, right? Uh, Sister Melissa. My name, it was just because um, it's a quote that you say a lot, but you're quoting from, oh, I don't know what it's from, so I'll just ask you. Uh, when you say that we'd rather die than commit one sin, Ellen White writes it somewhere, but I can't remember. There's several places that, that bring it. Let me talk to you about it later. But very good, very good. All right, let's go a little further. Now, my brothers and sisters, is there a science of receiving the rain? Or will it just fall on me? Is there a special preparation? Yes. Do you see why we need the rain? Do you see why? Yes. We could never do this by ourselves. No. So my question now as we get ready to conclude is what is the science behind receiving the rain? Now, if you know this, we can finish this last part very quickly because this is what we studied last week. So this is a review. Now, if you don't know it, then, you, then they, they're going to make us go into overtime. <laughs> but you, you, you got to know it. Now, tell me something. What is more important than receiving this rain right now in this final generation? Do you know it is the latter rain that seals us? We're told that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption in Ephesians 4.30. The latter rain seals us. The latter rain settles us. The latter rain makes irreversibly, re irreversible the work of what God did for us under the early rain. So my brothers and my sisters, we must show that we want to be settled. Working with God in that early rain time, it shows us that. Now, so I want to come back to this. What is the science behind receiving this rain? What is the science behind receiving this rain? 
It says in the ministry of healing 453, there is a what? Science. There is a science of Christianity that must be mastered. A science as much deeper, broader, higher than any human science as the heavens and, uh, uh, are higher than the what? Earth. Often the education and training of a lifetime must be what? So if we're going to learn the science of receiving the rain, guess what we're going to have to do with much of our education? But I, I thought that it was okay to wear that. You know what you're going to need to do with that? I thought it was okay to eat that. You know what you're going to need to do with that? I thought it was okay to live there. I thought it was okay to do that and think that and have that in a relationship. We better be ready to discard all that. It says, often the education and training of a lifetime must be discarded that one may become a what? Learn in the school of Christ. Now notice the word. What's the word? Why often? Why not everything? Because sometimes you might find out when you study the Bible that what you were doing was not bad. <laughs> And you didn't know it was good or bad, but when you studied the Bible, you said, praise the Lord, that was a good thing. You know, <laughs> That's something we can hold on to. So we don't just throw, go around throwing things away. What we are doing to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because it is what? But anything not in harmony with it, we need to get rid of it. Now it says, our hearts must be what? Educated. Not condemned, but what? Educated to become steadfast in God. We are to form habits of that will enable us to resist temptation. We must learn to look not downward and be discouraged, but look what? Upward and be encouraged. It says the principles of the what? Word of God. Principles that are as high as heaven and that can pass eternity. I love that. What you say? We are to understand in their bearings upon our what? It is to be practical to us. We're to see the principles of heaven and show how they're to be brought down into the practical everyday life. It says every act. How much? Every word, every thought is to be in accord with these what? So how much of our life is going to come into this cleansing process? All of it. All must be brought into harmony with and subject to Christ. This is part of the science of receiving the rain. Now, let me back it up. You didn't see that, did you? <laughs> what is the science? In understanding the basic science of receiving the rain, what do we learn that we have to understand? The basic science in receiving the rain. Very basic. And receiving the rain. What is the science? Remission of sin. Mm -mm. Now you're going more into the details, which is not wrong. You're going into the details, though. Back up to basic, basic. What is the basic science between uh, of receiving the rain? Think about it now. Come on, brother Haywood. Talk to me, brother Haywood. There's a sin problem. Now give me understanding of the science. Now science. See, if I take, uh, let's say right now, I take some bricks. And I take, let's say, 50,000 bricks and I drop them down. Is that a house? No. no. But I can be a science in building. I can have a, uh, understand the science of building and I can arrange those bricks into a what? House. Yes. Now, just because the house is a collection of bricks arranged in a certain way does not mean just a pile of bricks is a house. Am I right? right. Same material, but one is arranged into a science of actually working efficiently. And so my brothers and sisters, I want us to understand not just the details and the bricks. I want us to see the signs behind how they are arranged. So we say, ah, I understand what's happening. There's a science behind receiving the rain. Uh, hold on. Yes. Yes. Now, now make the connection. So the removal of sin says what? Then I can receive. That's the, that the, the, the relationship is this. There is a relationship between sin and the rain. If I'm sinning, it's preventing me from receiving the rain. And unless my sins can be removed or taken away, I cannot receive the rain. There's a direct relationship because always sin, as my brother said, is the problem. Are you following? So then we have to understand how God deals with sin in order to receive the rain. This is the work of the priest. Remember that? Here's the ark. Remember the, the God's presence in the ark? Remember we read that the temple erected for the abode of the divine presence, the sanctuary, was designed to be a what? For Israel and for the world. From eternal ages, it was God's what? Purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraph to man, should be a... So the sanctuary temple was a type or a symbol of what God wanted for every human being. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6? Your bodies are the temple. So the sanctuary temple was just a type of the human body. God dwelt in it, but he really wants to dwell where? 
From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being from the bite of the Holy Spirit to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the, of the creator. Let's read this together. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. What does cease mean? Now, do you see the science? Sin stops us from being a temple. The removing of sin remakes us into a what? Temple. So my brothers and sisters, why did God have to make an earthly temple that was made of materials like uh, 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 gold and silver and wood and furniture? Why do you have to make a temple like that? Sister Teresa. Yes, but that, that's true. That's true. That's true. But there's, there's something else more basic. Uh, why did he, why did he do that? He wanted to dwell in us, but he could not do that because of our condition. So he said, let me make another place that I can dwell in to teach them the lesson so that I can bring them back to a place where I can once again dwell in them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God has to dwell among us until he can teach us the plan of how to get sin taken away so he can once again dwell in us. And then there'll be no need for a temple anymore. Amen. So that in Revelation, it says in the new heaven and new earth, there will be no need of a temple therein. Because the plan of redemption would have accomplished its purpose. I don't know about you, but this is beautiful to me, brother and sister. The beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. This is the plan. He wants to do something in me so that Jesus can be so close that he doesn't just live with me. He lives in me. And if Christ be in you, you are a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away and all things become new. The problem with us is that we won't learn the plan of how to allow Jesus to come in. And so behold, he says, I stand at the door. That was the Laodicean church. The last church. Us. Is there a plan to bring her back? Yes or no? Yes. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man, what? No longer revealed the glory. You remember when God made man? Formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a? And when he breathed into his nostrils and he became alive, God came inside and began to dwell in man. He was a temple. But something drove God out. Sin. Sin. And God has no longer been able to dwell in man until he set in motion the plan of. And that is to restore in man the image of God so that he can once again what? But in order to do that, what must he do to sin? Take it away. And in order to do that, there were two works, symbolized by the work of the lamb and the work of the priest. So when on the cross he said, it is done, he said, that my work as a lamb was done in this process. Well, what was the work of the lamb? John sees Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God, talk to me now, which taketh away the sin of the world. Is that in the Bible? Yes. Are you ready? Where is that in the Bible? John chapter 1. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's go. Let's go. Let's make see everything we believe is in the Bible. Let's go there. Let's go to John chapter one. Let's go to John chapter one. Let's see if we see that in the Bible. Let's see if what we believe. Did we make that up at seven Adventists or is it in the Bible? John chapter one. It's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in that word of God. All seven day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. John chapter one, verse 29. Brother Bill, would you read that for me, please? Did you hear that message? Amen. That is good, brother. Bill, that was a, he preaching to us. But it says that the lamb was, what was his purpose? To take away the what? Sin. Now, once the sin is taken away, we can receive the rain. Once the sin is taken away, we can receive the rain. That's why until Jesus said it is done on the cross, the Holy Spirit could not come to the earth. This had to happen after. Jesus did his work as a lamb, and it was the result of him now becoming our priest for us. So now we begin to start seeing the science. Now, that's the basic science. Now, in conclusion, let's look at the detail. And the removal of sin, let's look at the detail because we must see this reign under the relationship of the early and the latter reign. Now, even literally, let's go to Deuteronomy for a moment. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let's go there quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 11. 
Deuteronomy chapter 11. Notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 11. And Sister Kia, if you read this for us loud and clear. Deuteronomy chapter 11. If you read for us verse 13. Now I want you to see this carefully. I want to see if you see this. Deuteronomy 11. And we want to look at verse 13. What does the Bible say in verse 13? Now, there's a condition. How do we know there's a condition? If yeah. Diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So what was the first part of the condition? If you will be willing to love me and do what? Keep my commandments. Now, what's going to happen if we do that? Verse 14. That I will give you the right Wait a minute, Sister Kia. Is that what your Bible said? That I will give you what? So if we keep the commandments of God through the love of God, his faith, diligently, he will give us the rain. Amen. So now I want to ask you a question. Then what would have to happen to stop us from receiving the rain? Not keeping the commandments. The third angel says, here are they. They keep the commandments. So what are they going to receive? What are they going to receive? The rain. So my brothers and sisters, there's a relationship between sin, the transgression of the law, and not receiving the commandment. So in order to receive the rain, the science tells us that sin has to be removed. Now, the early rain, do you remember? In order to receive the early rain, we found out, in order to receive the early rain, we found out that there were basic things that had to happen. You should tell me this quickly in review before we close. In the latter rain, also basic things had to happen. Now, you remember under the early rain, we saw that in order to receive the rain, you had to receive something that was called remission. the remission. <laughs> the remission of sin. What is, where, in the, where in the Bible would I go to see that the early rain, Pentecost, receiving the Holy Ghost was the result of receiving the remission of sin? Where would I go in the Bible to see that? Acts 2. Acts two. Let's go there. Let's go there quickly. We, we run out of time. Let's go there quickly. Acts 2. I want to get to the heart before we close. We're right here at the heart. And I want to get, here, get through this before we close. Let's go to Acts 2 quickly. Acts the second chapter. Now Acts 2 is when Pentecost opened up. This is when the early rain started to fall. This is when Jesus was being anointed as high priest. Acts chapter 2. We studied this from the sanctuary in detail. Now in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1. Let's read that together. Acts 2 verse 1. What does the Bible say in verse 1? And when the day of Pentecost. That's when the early rain started pouring out. Was fully come. They were all with one accord and one place. Now, let's see why they had received this gift of the Holy Spirit. Jump down to verse 37. Sister Davis, would you read verse 37, Acts 2 and verse 37, please. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So they wanted to know what to do. He tells them, verse 38. What's all this for? for the now, once we receive the remission of sins, what happens? Continue. So, in order to receive the uh, in order to receive the early rain, the Holy Ghost given to us in the early rain as it opened up, what has to happen to us? Talk to me. We must experience the remission of sins. Now, what about the latter rain? In order to receive the latter rain, what must be the experience, the end result of the experience in order to receive the latter rain? Be Acts 3. Whenever you think of an answer, what I want your mind to be trained to do in Bible Training Institute is always when you're thinking of an answer, you're thinking, what Bible text gives me the understanding of this? Not my thoughts, not what the church says, not what a person says, but what does the what does the what Bible say? Hold on, hold on, hold on. What does the Bible say? So our key is to understand what the Bible says. So now in Acts chapter 3, the Bible tells us something very carefully. Acts 3, in order to receive the refreshing or the rain. Let's look at verse 19. Uh, would you read that for us, Mother Davis? Acts 3 verse 19, what does the Bible say? Now, give me another name for the refreshing. Give me another name for the refreshing. The latter rain. We studied that. 
So the, the refreshing is the latter rain. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is necessary to receive the latter rain? Is it simply the remission of sin? What did they say? So in order to receive the latter rain, we must not only receive the remission of sins, we must receive the blotting out of sin. And that's the last thing the priest has to do before Jesus can come back. So then, my brothers and sisters, we're right back where we left off. The issue is bringing Jesus out. But the only way to bring him out is to get the sins blotted out, which will bring the latter rain. But before we can receive the latter rain, we must be brought back to a sinless state by the remission of sin. So my brother and sister, the key is, how can we get our sins blotted out? But first, how can we get our sins remitted? Because that's the only way we can see the other rain. We can talk about the other rain all we want, but we will never receive the other rain until we have remission of sin. So then the question is, what is the remission of sin? Is that a good question? What is the remission of sin? Because this is what the gospel is all about. What is the remission of sin? Forgiveness. The forgiveness of sin, brother Tony. Now, the, all the remission of sin is, the word remit just simply means the sending away. You know how you get a word missionary? It means sent. Miss. Where we get our word missile. It just means sent out. When you have a missile project, out, just sent. And again, so re, uh, remiss just means the sin sent away. Take it away. That's all it means. So the remission of sin, we study from the Bible, is nothing more than the forgiveness of sin. Now, I'm not going to go to the Bible now, but we looked at several texts last time and we looked at what the remission of sin means, forgiveness of sin. If you don't know, let me know. We can talk about it later. But right now, it means forgiveness of sin. Always dealing with sin. Always that. Now, my brothers and my sisters, my question is, how then do I get my sin remitted? Do I just say, I want my sin remitted and whoop, sins are remitted? Or is there a science? What is the science? So there is a science. And in science, okay, if, if, I, if I were uh, scientifically uh, doing something, does it matter the order that I do things in? Yes. Matters. So then when we talk about the remission of sin, can I just give any answer? Or is there order? Order, order is heaven's first law. So there's an order. And how to get sins forgiven. And most people have never fully gone through it or don't go through it in its fullness to receive the fullness of the rain. Now, what we found out is that the early rain is just like, a, it's just like this into a cup. Now, if I pour water into a cup, is it immediately full when I pour water into a cup? No. What do I have to keep doing in order to get full? Keep pouring. Keep pouring. And then what happens to the water? The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. Yeah. See, God is not just wanting us to get a drop of the rain. He wants us to be what? Filled. Yeah. On the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So then that means that most people can get a drop every now and then, but never get filled. That means the latter rain can never work for us. And most of us have never been full of the Holy Spirit. And then remained in that full state. Now, let's see how. Let's understand it. So what you're going to find is, see, there are, there are degrees here. Measure. It happens little by little. In other words, it's an indirect relationship to sin. And we're going to show you that in just a moment. Now, so let's talk about how sin is forgiven. So this is how to get the early rain. This is what the disciples preach. This is what they preach. So how do we get our sins forgiven? What is the first step in the science of the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin to receive the early rain? This is the greatest thing we can be learning in a simple way to deal with sin. What's the first thing? Well, first, when the Holy Spirit comes, the first work the Holy Spirit does, John 16 says, John 16, 7 and 8 says that when the Spirit comes, he's going to do something. He's going to convince the world of sin. Convince, convict. We found out very carefully, that was in John 6, 7 and 8, but we found out that this says, the first step in what? Reconciliation to God is the conviction of sin. Just like John 16 says. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does, he wants to convict us. He wants to tell us, convince us what we are doing is wrong. Now, that is opening the door to bring us the Holy Spirit. To bring us the early rain. But you know what happens? Most people don't understand. That's not the first step now. Don't, don't, don't confuse that with the first step. That's what the Holy Spirit does, but that's not our first step. The Holy Spirit convicts us. That's what he does to start the process off. So the Holy Spirit can't just come inside of us and fill us. 
The Holy Spirit knocks at the door of our hearts because he never forces an entrance. The conviction of sin is him knocking, saying, I want to come, but he can't come in as long as sin is there. And so he convinces us what we're doing is wrong. Now, my brothers and sisters, how do we respond? Because how we respond will determine whether we receive the early rain or whether we get seared by the Spirit of God and probation closed on us. So now, the very first step when the Holy Spirit comes to convict us, what, was it, what, what, is, it, what, what is this first step? Talk to me, somebody. Acknowledge. Acknowledge, acknowledge what? Sin. Not just acknowledge, but to acknowledge my sin. All of it has to do with sin. That's the science. Now, where would I go in the Bible to see? Because you need to know this in the Bible. You need to know this so that when you're... See, do you know that we should have been doing this this week? If you were here last week, we studied this. Yeah. This week, I don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit came to me. As, I, as I'm working, I recognized him even more fully this week. I saw the Holy Spirit come to me and said, boom, that is wrong. Don't go there. Don't think that. Don't say that. Don't do that. And I, I was able to, ah, Holy Spirit, you want to give me a little more of the rain. Amen, amen. I thought, man, he wants to give me some of the rain. So I said, okay, I acknowledge, dear God, that is wrong. Amen. I don't want to have no part with it. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this is the very first step. But if we don't understand what the Holy Spirit does to come to us, we won't even know that the Holy Spirit is trying to come in. We would think that we're being condemned when God is really trying to open the door to come in. Wouldn't that be a shame? Yes. Now, where in the Bible does it tell me that the very first step is the acknowledging of my sin? Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3. Let's go there quickly. Let's go there quickly. Let's run through these steps quickly. We've got to make sure we have them. Please write them down. Every one of us can be doing this this week because the Holy Spirit is coming. We'll never get the latter rain unless we understand this. Go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. And what verse did you say, my sister, in Jeremiah 3? All right, let's look at 13. Jeremiah 3, would you go and read that? Jeremiah 3 and verse... Now, back up to verse 12. It's important to get verse 12 in there too. Uh, I know you're just cutting it down, but get verse 12 in there first, please. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that a man, if he's backsliding, he could have once had an experience, but going goes what? Backwards. Yeah. Have you ever made a commitment to God? I'll never do that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then did it again? Mm -hmm. I'll never say that again. And said it again? Mm -hmm. I'll never lose my temper like that. I'll never eat that again. I'll never watch. I'll never listen. I'll never go there. I'll never do that again. But you did it again. That's a backslider. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope for a backslider? Yeah. There is. Now, watch what the hope is. Continue, my sister. Is God merciful? Amen. Praise God. Well, how can we get access to this mercy? Verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast Stop. If we're going to get this mercy when we sin, what is the first thing that we have to learn to do? Acknowledge. acknowledge. Everyone else's iniquity. My iniquity. Mine. I had to be able to look and say, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. Can we ever break the addiction of sin without acknowledging? No. If you went to any alcoholic program, I told you before, AA, and you went to the program, the very first step before they start going through the, de the details of how to stop drinking or smoking or any of the narcotic classes, you know the first thing you have to do? Uh, my name is and I am an alcoholic. If, if, if they come to you and you say, my name is John Doe, but uh, I still like to have a few drinks every now and then. They're going to say, you're not ready yet. <laughs> I'm just a casual, what do they call it? Uh, I'm just a, so I'm just a social drinker. I'm just a social drinker. Now, now you've been socializing from six in the, in the evening to 12 at night. That's a little more than social drinking. You're, you're drunk. That's what it is. But, but social drinking, this is what the man, he, we try to lessen the guilt. We do not acknowledge in its full dark hue. It's sinful. It's selfish. It's wrong. And anybody tells us that, we upset at the, the minister who tells us. Now, my brothers and sisters, but this is the first step in being able to receive the early rain to be brought back to a sinless state. So my first, Lord, I have to see what sin is and acknowledge. Can a young person learn this? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Can an adult learn this? Yes or no? Yes. Can a family learn this? Yes. This is the first step. Now, if you are convicted of sin, is that, is that God condemning you? No. You know, sometimes persons come, well, I'm being condemned that, that God is condemning me. No, God didn't condemn you. To tell you you're wrong is not condemnation. To tell you you're wrong is to point out a fact. 
Condemnation says that there's no hope for you. God doesn't condemn you. You condemn yourself. I condemn myself. God does not condemn us. God says, look, we're sinners, but we can be saved if we follow the plan. First part of the plan, when God comes back, he will acknowledge, uh, he'll convict us of sin. We're to acknowledge that we're wrong, that we're sinners. What's the second part? What's the second step? There's a science. The second step, once I acknowledge that it is wrong, that's not enough to receive the early rain. That's just the first step. The second step tells me that then once I acknowledge my sin, I must then be led by the Holy Spirit to repent of my sin. Now, we found out that repentance has two parts. Tell me the first part of repentance. What is the first part of repentance? To be sorry for my sin. Now, is it possible to do sin but not be sorry about it? Do you know that if we're not sorry about sin, no early rain. We can even say, Lord, I acknowledge it's wrong. It's wrong, but I love doing it, so I'm going to keep doing it. I like watching it. I like eating it. I like doing it. I like having it. And so I'm going to keep doing it. It's wrong. I acknowledge it's wrong. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't open the door for the early rain. That opens the door for me to condemn myself. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So my brothers and sisters, that acknowledging is the first step. But the next step is to yield so that God can make me what? Sorry for my sin. Where in the Bible does it tell me that repentance is talking about a sorrow for sin? Where is that in the Bible? That repentance is speaking of a sorrow for sin. Where is that in the Bible? Second Corinthians, sister, many. Chapter seven. And second Corinthians seven. Let's go there quickly. Let's go there quickly. Our time is almost gone. Go to second Corinthians seven. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. And look what the Bible says in verse 8. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 8. What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 8? What does the Bible say? It says in verse uh, 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle have made you sorry, though it were but for a... Verse 9. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow. I rejoice uh, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow to what everybody? Amen. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow does what? Worketh repentance to salvation or redemption. So repentance means that I'm sorry for my what? Sin. Remember what David said in Psalms 38, 18? David said, I'm sorry for my sin. Not everyone else said, I'm sorry for what? My sin. It's very specific. We have to learn how to be very specific with sin. You know, some people, they want to get the early rain like this. If I commit any sin to anyone in this room, please forgive me. They want to go to God. Lord, forgive me for all my sins, just like that. And boom, early rain. That's not the science. The science says, I will be sorry for mine. I've got to look and acknowledge not just a general sin, but my specific one or ones. Every one of them, private or public, secret, cherished. And everybody has some cherished sin somewhere that no one else knows about. And think that we're going to pass the judgment. We will never pass the judgment like that. God sees it. God's going to come to every one of us. And say, please, I want to take your sin. You know, he doesn't want us to die. He wants to save us. He loves us. But he says, please give me your sin. Don't try to hide it from husband or wife or parents or children. Don't try to hide it because he that covers his sins, he cannot prosper. But he that confesseth them, he can find mercy if he learns to do this plan. So first, we're to acknowledge and be sorry for our sins. What's the second part of repentance? Talk to me. To turn from that sin. It's not enough just to be sorry about it and then keep doing it. If I'm going to be sorry about it. I've got to come to the place that if I'm sorry about it, I've got to learn to turn from that sin. What's the third step? The third step is to do what? You know the text. We're not going to turn there. We looked at all these texts last time, so I'm not going to go to all the texts. And the third step, the Bible says, you know it, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from how much? 
all unrighteousness. So my brothers and sisters, in order to get our sins uh, remitted or forgiven, we have to first do what? Confess them. But what if I confess, but I'm not sorry? No early rain. What if I'm sorry, but I don't confess? No early rain. What if I try to confess, but I don't acknowledge in myself that it's wrong? Well, I'm just going to say it's wrong just so everybody else will see, hear me say it's wrong. This is a science. Now, my brothers and my sisters, we must know in our hearts it's wrong. We must then be sorry that it's wrong. We must turn from it's wrong. Then we must confess openly declaring before God and man, I confess and God, I want you to take away my sin. Amen. Now, once we confess our sin, what's the next step? To accept or receive forgiveness by faith. That's what Romans 3 meant when he said that through the blood of Christ that he has declared remission for sins that are past. Now we have forbearance to God that we are to accept it by faith. God can forgive us. You know, God can forgive a man and the man won't, is not willing to accept forgiveness. I did so wrong. I, I, I messed up this time. I, I can't go back to God. I can't go to church until I get things right. You know, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't now have a relationship with God. You know, we're told that sin and repentance should not be made an obstacle between the soul and the sinner. That a man can come to Jesus just as he is. Deep in sin. And that man can come to Jesus just as he is. Now, God's not going to give him the early rain just as he is. There's a special preparation. And if he remains like that, then he's not going to be saved. But that man can come just as he is and God will take him just as he is and tell you, this is the plan. I made a provision. If you're willing to follow that plan, I can save you. Here's the plan. Acknowledge that you're wrong. Yes, Acknowledge on every level that you see that this is sin. Number two, be willing to let me make you sorry for that sin where you don't want to do it no more. Amen. Two, a, a second part of that, help me to give me, let me give you power so I can turn you from that sin. Amen. Then you confess. Amen. Declare. If you did something wrong to somebody, tell them. If you did it wrong only to God, tell him. Then you confess that sin, and then when you have done that, by faith you say, Lord, the blood of Jesus cleanseth me from how much? Oh. This is righteousness by faith. This is the only way to get it. This is the plan of redemption. Now, once I receive forgiveness by faith, what's the next step? Once I receive that forgiveness by faith, God now, through that, is able to forgive me. He then forgives me of that sin. And gives me his Holy Spirit. Is that enough? Remember I told you we made another step that really can be inside repentance. But another one just so it's clear to us. Then what do I do next? The Bible says, whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sin. Proverbs 28, 13. Now another way to say that, let's go to Acts 5 as we get ready to conclude. Go to Acts 5. Go to Acts 5. Acts the fifth chapter. Look what the Bible says in Acts 5. Verse 32. Acts 5, verse 32. Let's read that together. Acts 5 and verse 32. What is the last thing that God wants me to do? Acts 5 and verse 32. What does the Bible say in Acts 5, verse 32? You there, amen? Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? And we are his what? Witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost. Whom God hath given to them that what? Obey. So what's that last thing I need to do? Obey. So no matter whatever God says, I got to start obeying now. Now what happens when I follow this step? Early the early rain. Now what happens when God shows me another sin? And then once that sin is gone, what does he give me in this place? A drop of rain. I come to another sin. What does he do? I come to another sin. What does he do? Well, when are we full? When we bring to him how much? All. When all of our sins are brought to him, then we're brought into the fullness of the early reign and the day of Pentecost would have fully come for us. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, but what if I hold on to some of that sin? My cup will never be full. Brother Bill. Now, you hear what you hear Brother Bill said? In the natural, when you have too much rain, it could actually wash things away. But in the spiritual, there's never too much rain. Wow. Praise God, Brother Bill. 
This is what God wants to do. He wants us to have our cup filling, running over and overflowing. Does God want us to have? And then he can pour upon us the latter rain. Now we found out that in the latter rain, it doesn't just stop with this. We're not going through the text we did last week, but in the latter rain, we found out that in order to get our sins blotted out, our sins must be overcome. They must be what? Overcome. But not just some of them. We found out because the latter rain is during the time of the judgment that God is going to bring how much work into the judgment? Every, every word. And by bringing every work into the judgment, then in order to get the latter rain, it's not enough for me just to see a little bit of the sins in my life. You know what God's going to do? He's going to show me every secret thing. It's going to be brought to the judgment. And he's going to give me that latter rain. First, we must see what sin is, and then we must what? And God can then pour upon us this latter rain. Now, look what this says now. Volume 6, 136. Let's read this together. Watch this now. It says, the Lord has been what? Sending us line upon line. And if we reject these principles, we are not rejecting the messenger who teaches them. You know, if I teach you something that's from the Bible, you're not rejecting me. It says, but the one who has given us the, who is the one who's given us the principles? God. Reform. Continual reform must be kept where? Before the people. And by our example, we must enforce our what? True religion and the laws of health go hand in. Now let's read this together slowly. Watch what this says now. It is impossible to work for the salvation of men and women without presenting to them the need of breaking away from what? Why? Because if they don't break away from sin, no rain. Am I right? Which destroy the health, debase the soul, and prevent what? Divine truth. From impressing the mind. You know the divine truth can't impress our mind if we're doing certain sins? Now watch what it says. Men and women must be condemned. Oh. Is there a difference between condemnation and education? Yes. So what should we be going through in the next few weeks? Condemnation or education? education. Men and, so my people destroy for a lack of? No. Men and women must be taught to take a careful view of only what the public are doing. No. Of what? Every habit and every... Now, did they do this on the Day of Atonement? Yes or no? Yes. There was deep searching of heart. So this is what must happen in the most holy place. Get out to get the latter rain. We must not only just know, just for, repent of the sins we are aware of, but we must then take a careful what? You. Of how many habits? Every. Of how many practices? Every. I will never get the latter rain unless I look at every habit, every practice, and find out what is against God and get rid of those. It says, and at once... Put away. I wait 10 years after I learn what it is. What does that once mean? The moment I find out. So what happens if this week or in the next few weeks we begin to start studying truth and we find out things that we're not doing that we should be doing? Do we say, well, I didn't do that before, so I'm just going to continue staying, getting the early rain. Is that what we say? We take a careful view and then at once put away those things that cause an unhealthy condition of the body and thus cast a what? Dark shadow over the mind and thus prevent us from receiving the rain. Do you want to take a careful view of every practice? Yes or no? Every view. We're going, we're going to do it together. And we're going to see that this is what's going to be necessary in order to get the latter rain. Look what it says. I saw that none could share the. I, it says I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking for the time of. And the latter rain to fit in the stand of the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a what? Why? They had neglected the... They didn't get the special preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing or this latter rain that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God, to settle them. It says, I saw that none could share the refreshing or latter rain unless they obtained the victory over how much? Every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over how much? Every wrong word and every wrong what? Action. Should we therefore be drawn close to God, yes or no? Yes. Now, do you think that this is going to produce a different type of people on this earth, yes or no? Yes. It's going to produce a body. Now, I want to conclude here. I want to conclude here. There's much more to cover, but I want to bring it to a conclusion right here. I need 10 minutes to bring it to a conclusion. Can I have 10 minutes to bring it to a conclusion? Yes. All right. Let's bring it to a conclusion. Now, a question. I want to ask you a question. If we get victory over every sin, if we get victory over every sin, does that earn us the right to receive the latter rain? No. It doesn't? Are you sure? Yes. You're right. 
there's nothing that we can do that can earn the gift. Yet there are conditions. But the conditions doesn't earn us the gift. You know what earned the gift? Jesus. Do you know what it, Jesus? Do you know what do you know what Jesus did to make it impossible for us to receive the gift of the rain? What did he do? Why? What, what, what has to happen in order for sin to be blotted out or forgiven or taken away? What has to happen in order for that to take place? See, it's not us confessing that's making that happen. It's not us even acknowledging making that happen. Now, that's our part, but that's not why God could do it. If God didn't do what he did, we could confess all we want. We can acknowledge all we want. And the law would say, you're right. And the wages of sin is, is death. I acknowledge it. And he's going to say, good. You should acknowledge it. It's right. I'm sorry for it. And he say, good. You should be. I want to turn from it. And say, good. You should turn. You should never do it again. I want forgiveness. And he say, I'm sorry. I can't forgive you. I can't remit you of your sin. Because it has a price tag. Look at Leviticus. Look what the Bible says in Leviticus 16. Look at Leviticus 16. In order to take away the sin, either in the forgiveness of sin or to take away sin and the blotting out of sin, it's based on something that Jesus has done. Look at Leviticus 16. This is what gives him the ability to do what he does. Leviticus 16, look what the Bible says. In Leviticus 16, look what the Bible says. Let's go there quickly. Leviticus 16. I have about five minutes. Leviticus 16. Look what the Bible says in verse 27. Leviticus 16, verse 27. This is the Day of Atonement. Watch what happens at the end of the Day of Atonement and what gives him the ability to do it. Leviticus 16, verse 27. You there, amen? amen? The Day of Atonement. Well, what makes the atonement? Is it the, what the congregation does? No. Verse 27. Let's read it together. It says, And the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose, what everybody, blood was brought in, what for? To make an atonement. Tell me something. What makes the atonement? Blood. Blood. And not just any blood. The blood of Jesus. Now, one actual question. Why does blood atone for sin so that I can offer forgiveness? I mean, think about it. If you look at the word itself, for give. It's a compound word. In order for him to forgive, he had to give something for in order to forgive. What did he give for our sins in order to forgive us? He gave his blood. What is it about the blood? Why, why does blood make an atonement? Because without shedding of blood, no remission. No remission of sin without the shedding of blood. So what is it about the blood of Jesus? Now this is the gospel. What is it about the blood of Jesus? Talk to me somebody. 17. Leviticus 17 now. Leviticus 17. The gospel is in Le Leviticus. Leviticus 17. Look what the Bible says in verse 11. Leviticus 17. Let's start in verse 10. And Leviticus 17, verse 10, it says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of what? Blood. You know, this is why God said that man should never eat the blood of any animal. He told him something. There's something about that blood. He says, I will even set my face against that soul to eat of blood and will cut him off from among his people. Later on, we'll understand why. Verse 11. Why? For the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make what? An atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. What makes the atonement? Talk to me. You know, people say that Good Friday passed. And Good Friday really was the Passover. Am I right? Good Friday was the Passover. You know why the deaf angel was able to pass over? Because he saw the blood. It wasn't the bunny rabbit. No. And it wasn't the egg. Now, do bunny rabbits lay eggs? No. <laughs> Bill was talking earlier. He'd sure like to have that rabbit to make some money. <laughs> see, 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 look. See, see, until you go back and understand why the bunny rabbit, why the egg, it had nothing to do with Jesus. Wow. Nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, but that's a whole other story. My point is, that is not what he wanted to see that made him pass over. You can have a thousand bunnies and a ten thousand eggs and still the deaf angel will not pass over. But if he saw the blood. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, what is it about the blood that makes the atonement? The life. The life. Why does life atone? 
Why does life pay the price? Why does life make up the deficit? Why? Because the wages of sin is death. What type of death? Eternal, eternal death. So then what pays the price of eternal death? Now question, who is the only life? Who is the only blood? Now think about this now. Whose is the only blood? The blood of God. See, the only person that can die is someone who has to have eternal life. You know that the life of an angel could not atone. Because they don't have what? Eternal life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 16, that God only hath immortality. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the only one that could atone for sin is God. Amen. But we have a problem. What's our problem? God can't die. God can't die. So how in the world can God die so that he can atone for our sins? Talk to me. Hebrews 10 says... Go there. Let's go. Let's close. Let's go there. Go to Hebrews 10. Let's close there. Go to Hebrews 10. Oh, this is good. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. Look at Hebrews 10. Do you see? You're going to find out that unless God became man, became flesh, and took on a human body and lived a perfect life, suffer and bleed and die in the sinner's place and then offer that perfect life for us, there could be no salvation, no redemption. Look what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning in verse 1. Look the Bible says we conclude. Hebrews 10 verse 1. The Bible says, For the law having a what? Shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things. Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto what everybody? Right. Now the goal was to show how to get back to perfection. Right. But it couldn't do it in reality. It can only give an image of the things. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased or stopped to be offered because the worshippers once purged should have had no more what? In other words... If the sanctuary service could have taken away the sin from the mind and heart and life, then it would have stopped being going on year by year because there would have been nothing to confess. Nothing to get a victory over. There would have been nothing to be doing in the sanctuary. It would have been put out of business. But the fact that they kept doing it every year shows that they were continuing in what? Sin. So the Bible says in verse 3, let's continue. Verse 3 says, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins. How long? Why are they continuing to keep doing this? Verse 4, because for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should what? So as long as the sanctuary service with the type was going on, no early rain. No latter rain. Because sin has to be taken away and the blood of bulls and goats can't take sin away. So someone had to die for real before the rain. So my brothers and sisters, what had to happen? Can God die of himself? Yes or no? Remember we found out? Remember we found out it is finished? Remember we found out? It says that a body had to be what? Prepared. Look at what it says. Verse 4 says, For it is not possible that blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Verse 5, why? Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings would it not, but a body has thou what? Did that body receive a name? Yes or no? Yes. Was that body born on this earth? And that day he was born, the angels sang for joy. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, when he came on this earth, they said his name should be called Emmanuel, God with us. And they shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. This is what he was talking about on that cross. Amen. I did it. I did the work of the lamb. Behold the lamb. To take away the sin of the world. Now, look. When the voice of the angel was heard saying, the father calls thee, he who said, I lay thee down my life that I may take it again, destroy this temple, and in three days I raise it up, came forth from the grave to what? The life of the flesh is in the blood. That was in himself. Deity, what? Did not die. What happened? Humanity died. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the what? Don't you remember Lazarus? He, he didn't even go by Lazarus. Lazarus got sick. Sister Carlin, he couldn't go by there. You know why? If Jesus had been there, he, Lazarus couldn't have died. I mean, that's what, that's what the man said. I mean, the, 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 Mary, Mary, they said, look, we know that Lazarus, look, if you had been here, this would not have happened. They knew it. I mean, can you imagine? Here's a funeral. Everybody crying, weeping. And, and they cry. <laughs> they crying. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks by. Say, what you crying for? And the mother, my only son. 
I love them. Jesus just touches the coffin. And the boy gets up. And looks at his mother. Why are you crying, mother? Can you imagine? The, they look at this. And, and the mother now, the, 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 the cry in the morning turns to celebration. Amen. Jesus has the power to resurrect dead men back to life. Amen. Whether physical or spiritual. Amen. He's the resurrection and the life. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, deity did not die. What happened? Amen. Humanity did not. Look. Was the human nature of the Son of Mary changed to the divine nature of the Son of God? No. The two natures were what? He was both God and man at the same time. Blended in one person. The man who? Christ Jesus. In him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Why? The deity did not sink and die. That would have been what? Do you know that God, if he remained only God, could not have died for our sins and made an atonement. Mm -hmm. And so someone in the Godhead yeah. had to take on human flesh. Yeah. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the plan. Are you following? Yeah. Now, there were four things that you need to know about this literal body. And we're going to close. What are the four things? What's the first thing? Write this down. What's the first thing? The name of the literal body. Did Jesus make up his own name? No. Did Mary make up his name? No. Who gave the name for Jesus? God himself. Who carried the message to Mary of what the name was going to be? Gabriel. Don't forget that. What was the name to be? What was the name? Jesus. Jesus. Did it have something to do with his work? Yes or no? Yes. What was his name? What does Jesus mean? Saving. No, Jesus. Christ anoints. Jesus means saved from sin. It means savior. Savior from what? Sin. That's why you should call his name Jesus. To save from sin. Now, did that body have a symbol? Yes or no? What was the symbol of that body? Remember what John said when he saw Jesus? Behold the... So the symbol of this body that was to take away sin and save us was called the what? Lamb. He was not a literal lamb. That lamb was a symbol. Did he have a work? Yes or no? Yes. And the symbol, the symbol identified the work that that lamb was to do. Are you following? Yes. So the body had a name, the body had a symbol, and the body had a, you better follow this, and the body had a what? Could Jesus do his work anytime? He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. John 9, 4. So what is the four things? Right? Talk to me. What's the four things? We're we'll, going to close right here. If we want to be a part of this plan of redemption, the body, the literal body of Jesus had a what? Name. Had a what? Symbol. Had a what? Word. Had a what? Now, once we finish that, we're going to close. Now, and we're just, we, I, I can't teach you anymore because the time is gone. So I'm just going to tell you this and we're going to study as we continue on. Now, we're going to close here. Name, literal body. Now, question. Remember what this says? In order for God to finish the work on, in the outer court on earth, what had to happen? He had to have a what? A body. So what has to happen in order for God to finish the work in the heavenly sanctuary? He has to have another body. Now remember now, one was a natural body, the other is a what? As in the natural, so in the? Does God have a spiritual body? Now, does God have a spiritual head? Who is God's spiritual head? Who is the spiritual head? Now there's a church that teaches that they're the head. That church is called the Church of Rome. And they teach the Pope is the head, supposedly, of all Christian churches. That's not Christ, that's Antichrist. Christ is the head of the church. Does the Bible say so, yes or no? Go to Ephesians 1. Let me, let me make sure we, let's just, there's many texts, but let's just look at one text. Look at Ephesians 1. I, I don't want us to think that we're, that, that we're teaching Roman Catholicism. Now go to Ephesians 1. Look what the Bible teaches. And there are many sincere Christians who believe that, but they don't understand what the Bible teaches on this point. Christ is the visible head, not the Pope. Now look at Ephesians 1. That's based on the Bible. Look at Ephesians 1. Someone says, well, I thought the general conference president. No, no, no. General conference president, not the, the visible head. No, 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 no. He is a representative of the president, but not the head. The head is one man who's in heaven whose name is Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 1. This is what the Bible teaches. In Ephesians 1, the Bible says concerning, uh, let's go to Ephesians 5 so you can see it in plain language. In Ephesians 1 it says it, but let's go to Ephesians 5, see it in plain language. 
Ephesians 25, verse 22. Ephesians 5, verse 22 says, Wives, do what? Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the... Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is what? The head of what? So who is the head of the church? So any man on earth that teaches he's the head of the church is not Christ. He is Antichrist. So now my brothers and sisters, does Christ, the spiritual head of the church, does he have a spiritual body? Who is the spiritual body? Does the Bible say so? Continue reading. It says Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the. So Christ is the head and the church is the. So now his literal body had these four things. So his spiritual body, which is what? What is the spiritual body? Talk to me. His spiritual body must have these things. Now, in other words, if God's going to finish the work in the most holy place, he must prepare a spiritual body. And that spiritual body must have the same four things as his literal body, because as in the natural, so in the. Are we together? Yes or no? In the instruction given in our schools, the natural and the spiritual are to be combined. The same principles run through the spiritual and the natural world. That's why Jesus can say, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. Like the blade, like the ear, like the seed, so spiritually it does the same thing. This is what God wants us to understand. These are the four things. Now, what is this four things? Now, when a baby is normally born, what's one of the first things that mother says? Oh... What are we going to name little Johnny? Oh, what are we going to name little Susie? Is that right? Is that what they say? But they, they look, what are we going to name? They're thinking about the name. Now watch this now. Did you see that? You didn't see that, did you? Is there a name? You see that? What does that say? Seven of the Adventists have been chosen by God as a what? Now, God has a, has a church, and that church has to have a what? Name. Not made by the church, because the literal body didn't make his own name. That's right. The literal body got a name from God given by Gabriel, the covering chair. That's right. But God made the name. So the church must have a God-given name. Now, I want to ask you a question. Where did the name Seven Day Adventist come from? Look what it says. Second select the message three to four. Let's read this together. We are what? Seventh day Adventists. Are we ashamed of our name? We answer no, no, we're not. It is the name that the Lord has given us. The name that the Lord has given us. So the spiritual body has a name that they didn't make herself. It came also just like the literal body's name from God himself. It says it points out the truth that is to be the test of the churches. We are seventh Adventists and of this name we are what? Never to be ashamed. The banner of the third angel has inscribed upon it the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Our institutions have taken a name which sets forth the character of our faith. And of this name, we are never to be ashamed. I have been shown that this name means what? And in adopting it, we followed the light given us from? Do you know this name of this body, this church? It's not any other name. Do you know that the body that God is going to prepare has to be called seven Adventists? And we got to show you that. Now. This says that there will be an attack on that name. We may claim to be seven Adventists and yet fail of realizing what? How exalted is the standard to which we must attain in order to what? Do you know that we shouldn't just call ourselves seven Adventists just to say seven Adventists? We shouldn't just call ourselves seven Adventists. We should understand that this name seven day Adventism is an exalted name and it means something. We didn't understand what it means. Yes, sister. Okay, sure. Talk to me. Um, the seventh day, obviously, and the advent, the third advent, which one of them? Yes. You know, it means that, but it means something more than that. We're going to find out there's much more exalted than that. that. That's at the first glance on the surface, which is true. But there's something beneath the surface. And we're going to see that it starts from Genesis. And we're going to find out. Now, it says, some have felt ashamed of being known as seven Adventists. Those who are ashamed of this name should never connect with those who feel it an honor to bear this name. See, when you find out what a seven Adventist really is, you're going to feel it an honor. And you're going to find out that this is why you can't just become a part of that seven Adventist. There, you, there needs to be, do you know that there is, has to be classes that show us what a seven Adventist is before we become a part of this church? 
It means something. You know that you can't just become a part of something that's special without going through some qualification. You know that, right? Now, this says, and those who are Christ's witnesses standing where the truths of the Bible have placed them are worthy of the name they what? Now, later on, we're going to show you what the name actually means. But we know that we need to have a name. Satan wants to devour this name. What's the second thing this, this, this church must have? Talk to me. So this church must have a symbol. Literal body had a symbol. What was the symbol of literal body? Lamb. What is this? And that lamb was a symbol of the work that that body was to do. So the symbol has to identify the work that the body is doing. So my brothers and sisters, what is the symbol that God has given this church? The three angels. Remember I told you, it's coming back on the test. We'll come back to that. Don't forget this one. When we go into the most holy place, you understand this better. Three angels are that symbol that represent, uh, sorry, excuse me. The three angels are that symbol that represent the work. Now, question. Does the church have a work? Yes or no? Yes. What is the work of the church? Well, you have to preach the gospel. Well, every church has preached the gospel, so they say it. But there's a specific work that that gospel is to help us to accomplish. It's so that sins can be what? Blotted out. That's the cleansing of the what? Sanctuary. That is the finishing work. Now, my brothers and my sisters, unless the church is finishing the work, it can't have the symbol of the three angels. And if it doesn't have the symbol of the three angels, it shouldn't be given the name what? Seventh-day Adventist. Because the name is just symbolic of the work. Call his name Jesus because he's going to do a work of what? Saving. So if we have a name, it's supposed to be symbolic of our work. Now, my brothers and sisters, and that work has a what? I wonder. My time is gone. <laughs> so I can't tell us that. My time is gone. But I'm going to ask you this in conclusion. Do you remember the very first time we talked about at the very beginning of our talk today? Do you remember? Do you remember at the very beginning of our talk? I said, I said something. What number is that? I wonder if 2025 has anything to do with the Seventh Adventist Church. But my time is gone. Now, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you by the grace of God. 2025 means something. And God is telling us that there is a work of preparation. Are we ready? We're not ready. Can God get us ready? Yes. What is the first step? What's he want to do this week? Let me cut this off so I won't get tempted. What does he want to do this week? This week, he wants to convict us of sin. So that we can be made sad? So that he can take away what's separating us from what? Now, next week, pastor will be coming. We'll be praying for him. We will fellowship together with pastor. And then the week after that, Lord willing, we'll be right back here. I'm going to tell you something. Please review these notes because next week is going to almost seem like we're going to change subjects because now we're going back into where we left off. And now we've got to pick up what we've learned and put it back in place. We've got to go into the most holy place and understand what made us seven day Adventists. We're going to find out something very tremendous in these next few weeks. And we're going to, by the grace of God, we need to be praying. And it's going to start with us saying right now, Lord, just like we hear, sin has to be taken away. Do you want sin taken away? Yes. Sin is keeping us from a relationship with Jesus. But not just the public sins that everybody knows about. There's some secret sins. There's some special, personal things that God wants to speak to us on. Now, this week, God will talk to you about it. You don't even have to wait two weeks. God will talk to you about it today. If you say to him, Lord, what is in my heart and my home that needs to come out? You know, God will start talking to you. There's some things that need to go away. I want them to go. What do you say? Amen. That's your desire today? Yes. I want to get our home ready. We got to get our homes ready. Time is right now. Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, this is real. 
You want to come into our hearts, but there is sin in the way. And Lord, without you, we can't even work to get the sin away without you. You want to cooperate with us. And the first thing that you want to do is convict us. That we're sinners, not just generally, but of specific sins that we're doing Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And Lord, you want to show us not just the outward sins, but even the sins in our thoughts, our motives, our affections. What we're doing with our time and our money and our energy. Lord, you want to change our entire lives so that our sins can be blotted out and that you can settle us in a sinless state forever so that you can come out of that most holy place and crush the head of the serpent, finish the work of a day of atonement, and we can live happily ever after. Father, I plead with you that you would help us this week to not just hear this message and just wait till next week, but to take it serious to ask you personally, what is in my heart that is shedding out Jesus? He's standing. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, I want to hear the knock today. And I want to let him in. If you want to let Jesus in, just raise your hand wherever you are. You want Jesus to come in. But remember, if Jesus comes in, sin must come out. Amen. Heavenly Father, you see our hands lifted. Please. Sin has to go, Lord. Teach us how to receive your love so that we can acknowledge the conviction of sin. That you can make us sorry for it, Lord, that we'll turn from it by your grace, confess it and not hide it, forsake, acknowledge it, and receive by faith your forgiveness and learn to obey every command that you give us on every subject of life so that we can receive the gift of the early and the latter rain. Lord, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. If we fear you and keep your commandments, this is the whole duty of man. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you are the one who made the atonement and are offering that atonement for us in the most holy place. Thank you, Lord, that there's hope in Jesus. In Jesus' name.